Good morning, I'm just recording an audio lead-in. This is not the start of the meeting. Today is Tuesday, March 12th, 2024, 9.30 a.m. This is a regular meeting of the Board of Supervisors of Santa Clara County.
Good morning. It is 9.30, and just as soon as I see a quorum on the dais, we will call this, I will call the meeting to order. Oh, we do. Good morning. I am now calling to order this regular meeting of the uh, Board of Supervisors on Tuesday, March 12th at 9.30. Anjane, let's begin with a roll call vote. A roll call, please. Good morning, Supervisor Rennes. Not here yet. Supervisor Chavez. Here. Supervisor Simidian. Absent. Vice President Lee. Good morning, President. And President Ellenberg. I'm here. Good morning. We have a quorum. Thank you. I'm going to ask uh, President, uh, Vice President Lee to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise if you can. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is this morning's uh, invocation. And on this beautiful Tuesday, I have asked uh, Mr. Eugene Santian to present our invocation today in celebration of Youth Arts Month. Eugene is the North County Principal for Alternative Education at the Santa Clara County Office of Education. His work at the Office of Education enables children from all backgrounds to use art as an avenue of improvement. The board proclaimed March excuse me, as Youth Arts Month to highlight the transformative power of art. I'm so sorry, excuse me. I could clearly use a blessing this morning. Today, Eugene will talk about the power of art for some of our most vulnerable children. But before he does, I want to thank him. I see you there. <laughs> um, for the past two years, Eugene has kindly contributed artwork from his students at, the, at our annual State of the County event. Thank you for the amazing artwork you were able to curate and bring to the county for the broad audience here. The tremendous portrait that you donated to the city of San Jose for this year's um, uh, State of the, the City uh, captured the eyes of that's not right. The huge portrait that you donated for this year's uh, State of the County ca has captured the eyes of so many employees and onlookers. So thank you so much, and please uh, come up, and we look forward to your invocation this morning. Good morning, all. Oh. Should I move the mic? Or is there a mic? No, nope, you're right. There's okay. a microphone in the Sweet. podium. Thank you. Can you tell I'm green? All right. Good morning, all. Uh, good morning, board president and supervisors and community. Thank you for inviting me to speak today. I'm excited for the opportunity to share with you that student art has a positive and deeply therapeutic impact on our students. Our court and community school students come into our programs with a lot to share, a lot to say, a lot to teach us about life, their lives, our communities, our education system, our social structure, their trauma, their stories, their families, our families, I am happy to share with you that the County Office of Education leverages our positive relationships with community partners, with the Santa Clara County Library Department, probation, and behavioral health. Thanks to all our partners who provide our students arenas in which they can create and share their voice and their story so that we educators can learn how to provide them all they need to be empowered, to feel supported, to understand themselves, to understand the world, to feel heard, to feel cared for and appreciated, we have been able to provide them opportunities to create art and to have their art on display in their communities, including here at the county offices for the last two years at the State of the County Report. As I hung paintings, multimedia creations, and murals in these halls, our community would stop and ask me, who created this? Where did it come from? Is it for sale? They shared with me their love and appreciation of our students' artwork. They shared with me their own stories of growing up in Santa Clara County. Sometimes they would share their own struggles because looking at the artwork moves them, inspires them, inspires connection and wonder. Our court and community schools serve all districts across the county, north and south, east and west. 
We serve students grades six through 12. We serve them in moments of transition, moments of struggle and moments of growth. And I am happy to share with you that my colleagues and I work to ensure that they lose no opportunities while in our programs. My colleagues and I work to make sure they have every opportunity, including those they may have lost along the way. I appreciate working for the Santa Clara County Office of Education because it allows me to serve those who have struggled in our school systems. And I appreciate working in Santa Clara County because there is a heritage here, a deep history rooted in diversity, rooted in the story of immigrants, of many different cultures coming together to create something new. These are stories of families from around the world and they are stories that our students capture beautifully in their art. Their art is a part of their identity and whether it makes you smile or cry or question or wonder, it is moving. Last year, our first student in the county schools was eligible for the state seal of civic engagement on his high school diploma. The student from Blue Ridge School used his art to qualify for the seal, focusing it on his identity and as a teaching tool for the struggle of his people. Currently, our students in our court and community schools are working in partnership with Dr. Shelley Argawal from Health and Human Services to create or engage in a campaign of harm reduction, education, and safety around the opioid epidemic. Our students have the opportunity to engage in therapeutic art sessions with our community partner, Art House. They learn how to paint in collaboration with our community partner, uh, legend, uh, Portraits of Legends, and Silicon Valley Creates. These pieces decorated our schools and our libraries in the court schools. Students at Osborne School at Juvenile Hall have created murals in several spaces, including the Family Visiting Center. Students at Blue Ridge have created a mural composed of a collage of uplifting phrases in their gym. They learn how to design and press t-shirts. They learn classical styles like pointillism. They learn graphic design in our maker spaces and in partnership with the city of San Jose's park and recreation team, they learn photography. We are also engaged in a multi-year project that will see students at our core and community schools and Opportunity Youth Academy participating in creating murals that span the three stories of the stairwells at Santa Clara County Office of Education with themes dedicated to environmental literacy, ethnic studies, and civic engagement. This is just a snapshot of all the student artwork being created in our county. Thank you again for inviting me to be here today. I appreciate all you do for allowing me to share the arts education journey of our students and for your support of our schools, our programs, our students, our family, and our community. Thank you. Thank you so much. There are two adjournments listed on today's agenda, but I'm going to hold item 4B to the March 26th meeting and turn to Supervisor uh, Chavez to make her announcement. Thank you, good morning. Today, I'm asking my colleagues to adjourn in memory of Ann Bowers. Ann was born in November 1937 in Pennsylvania. She received her BA in English at Cornell where she served as a yearbook editor and her dormitory's president. In 2000, she earned an honorary PhD for public service from Santa Clara University, where she was a trustee emerita. Anne was the first director of personnel for Intel Corporation in the 1970s and the first vice president of human resources for Apple in the 1980s. She was co-founding trustee and chair of the board of the Noyce Foundation, established in 1990 in memory of her late husband, physicist Robert uh, Norton Noyce who co-invented the integrated circuit and co-founded Intel. The foundation focused on improving math and science instruction and learning in K through 12 public ed education until it ceased its operation in 2015. She served on the boards of the San Francisco, uh, San Francisco State University, Grinnell College in uh, Iowa, the American Conservatory, Conservatory Theater in San Francisco, Ed Voice in Sacramento, the Exploratorium in San Francisco, El Camino Hospital, and the Technology Center of Silicon Valley, among many, many others. She gave the Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center the largest individual gift in its history to support two of its residency programs, which they renamed the Bowers Program. She was an active member of 100K and 10, a network that sought to train and retain 100,000 excellent STEM teachers by 2021. 
She was a board member and past president, of, I'm sorry, past board chair of the Tech Museum of Innovation in San Jose, where she supported the establishment of the Bowers Institute to provide professional development support to teachers in the San Jose area and provide resources so they could incorporate STEM learning in their classrooms. As a former member of the Board of Sil Silicon Valley Joint Venture Education Initiative, Bowers helped Silicon Valley schools redesign educational programs for the 21st century. She was named Philanthropist of the Year by the Golden Gate Chapter of the Association of Fundraising Professionals. She is survived by her stepchildren, William Noyce, Penny Noyce, Priscilla Noyce, and Margaret Noyce. For many of you um, who may not have known Anne, she was a trailblazer, a barrier breaker, and a true pioneer. And on behalf of all of us, I want to share my deepest condolences with her family uh, for their loss, and also to thank her and their family for their generosity to the children of our community for generations. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Lee, please to add. Yeah, I just want to add uh, the contribution of uh, uh, Anne has been absolutely tremendous for this valley. Uh, if anybody who understands technology, uh, Intel Corporation, of course, is one of the foundational company in this valley. Uh, and she actually served uh, as the head of personnel uh, at Intel herself uh, and also first VP of Human Resources at another uh, tiny fruit corporation called Apple. Uh, so she's been in this valley for so long on these foundations that, that truly uh, is, is amazing on her own right. And of course, she's also married to the amazing Bob Noyce. Anybody who knows Bob Noyce uh, at the building, uh, RNB uh, at Intel, uh, that main building, is named after uh, uh, Dr. Bob Noyce. And, and these are absolutely the founders of Intel that really created who we are here, the, the integrated circuit valley. So I just want to say it's a huge loss to our valley. Uh, for for her for us for her and, and but but even though passing of uh, of uh, Bob Noyce he has she has been extremely generous with the amount of uh, funds that she's able to have and uh, it, it really is a true true sadness to this account I just want to mention that and uh, and huge uh, condolences to her family thank you thank you um, both and um, may their memory be for a blessing. We will move on uh, to item five, and um, this is a commendation um, in honor of Larry Stone, so I'm going to hop up there to present this. This morning, I'm presenting a commendation to our county assessor to mark the milestone of his now being the longest serving assessor in our county's history. Larry Stone, a Seattle native, was sworn in as the county assessor for Santa Clara County on January 1st, 1995, and on February 10th, 2024, he became the longest serving assessor, surpassing Louis Spitzer. He has been reelected eight times by county voters. Larry began his career in public office, serving on the Sunnyvale City Council, where he spent 16 years as council member and mayor. His time on the Sunnyvale City Council, in addition to his service as assessor, has earned him the distinction of being the longest serving elected official in Santa Clara County. Over the decades, Larry has streamlined operations in his office, eliminated backlogs, and elevated customer service to the highest level while regularly staying under budget. His office has been acknowledged by the State Board of Equalization as one of the best managed assessor's offices in the country. Outside of his work, Larry and his wife Carmen have lived in Sunnyvale since 1970 where they raised three sons. He received an MBA from the University of Washington, go dogs, go dogs. and studied at Harvard's Institute of Politics. Larry, this is your Hank Aaron surpassing Babe Ruth moment, or for you kids out there, think LeBron. I am sure you have a word or two to say on this occasion, so Thank I welcome you, you to much. do that, and then Thank we will you. present you with I this certificate. That. Well, uh, thank you very much, and I really appreciate all my senior staff is here to, and as well as my wife, Carmen. You know, when 
My friends learn that I am the longest serving uh, county assessor uh, in Santa Clara County for the past 175 years. They look at me kind of curiously and think, look, Larry, get a life, will you? <laughs> well, it's been a good life and a good career, I guess, because I've been an elected official for 45 years now. Uh, and I've had opportunities, as you might expect, to run for public office a number of times in other places during that 45-year time frame. Uh, but I chose, and I prefer, management over policy. Uh, the assessor's position is a management position. You get there by election, that's the political part. But after that, it's all about management. Uh, when you're responsible for a $620 million, billion dollar budget and property taxes, uh, and, and when I started in 1995, there's only two more employees in my office today than there was on January 1st, 95, 1995 when I took office. I've returned $31 billion of my budget back to the general fund unspent. Uh, so you better know management if you're handling that kind of, of uh, property and budget. So I really appreciate this designation, even though it took me 45 years to get here, or 29 years, I guess, for, for the assessors. And I really appreciate the county for this commendation. And I appreciate the fact that my wife and my Senior staff is here to share it with me. Thank you. I'm going to invite my colleagues down for the photo op, but Supervisor oh. Lee has uh, asked to make a comment first. Oh, sure. Well, Larry. Um, Larry certainly has lived in Sunnyvale for many decades uh, with his wicked dry sense of humor that we have suffered all these years. Uh, and certainly have served in the city of Sunnyvale for 16 years, both as council member, vice mayor, and mayor, making significant changes to improve the backlog right here for our county with the strong focus on customer service, providing accurate assessments to millions of properties, commercial and residential, ensuring a fair, equitable, and maintaining a healthy revenue and cash flow to keep our county running smoothly. And even though he always get booed, right? Yes, I actually think he enjoys that notoriety. And thank you for Carmen for sharing him all these years for his great work for us and really appreciate that. Uh, and, and you are saying to put up that, uh, this guy. <laughs> but honestly, thank you so much for, for all your amazing work. You are a true leader in your field, uh, being heralded as a proven political success in the time of political failure by the Pulitzer Prize winning author and Washington Post reporter, Haynes Johnson. I looked that up. So congratulations. Thank you. Pass up our photo, Carmen. It is now Supervisor Simidian's moment to present a commendation to Sherry Sager. Thank you, uh, Madam President and uh, board members and members of the public. Uh, <clears throat> I had occasion recently to attend a retirement event at uh, 
I'm pausing because the name keeps changing on me, but uh, the Packard Children's Hospital, Stanford Packard Children's Hospital in uh, my district where Sherry Sager uh, was retiring after almost 30 years, three decades of service uh, in the government relations world and as a senior vice president. And um, there was a nice event, dinner, uh, and an opportunity to share a few words there and then uh, in her organization. But I wanted to uh, lift up the recognition uh, here in a more public place because, um, as I said that evening, uh, there really are, for me, uh, three takeaways for Sherry's work over these three decades in uh, the Packard organization, the Children's Hospital. The, the first was that Sherry was always there, always. Uh, you call folks in any organization and they are sometimes busy. They have other duties. They have some place to be. They have a meeting to go to. Uh, they have work to do. Uh, but when we needed help, it was sometimes a life and death situation in the moment, literally. It was almost always a matter of some importance. And literally over all those years, every single time uh, my office or I reached out to Sherry Sager, she was there for us. And when I say for us, I don't mean for me personally, I don't mean for my office, I mean for the larger community. And that's what you hope uh, will happen, but frankly, it's uh, all too hard to come by. So first and foremost, as I say, congratulations and thank you, and our board acknowledges the service over these three decades. Uh, I wanna say thank you for always being there. The second thing I wanna say is that Sherry always knew what she was talking about, which is not always the case. It's hard, <clears throat> it's particularly hard when you're in a complex field like healthcare, uh, where both the technology and the science and the medicine and the politics and the government are always changing. Uh, and it's particularly hard when your job is to liaise, stay in touch with other folks out in the community. Um, an awful lot of the time uh, in other environments, folks will say, um, need to get back to you on that. And occasionally Sherry had to say that. And an awful lot of the time, folks will say, well, let me put you in touch with the right person. And that's always helpful. And occasionally, Sherry had to say that. But what I was struck by, what I have been struck by over these many years now, is that whenever we needed help, and we asked Sherry, she knew what she was talking about. Um, she didn't shoot from the hip. She had knowledge that came from a real deep commitment to understanding the world in which she worked and the world in which she provided all of us with some assistance. So thank you for always being there. Thank you for knowing what you were talking about. And the third part is um, uh, I want to acknowledge what I'll uh, call Sherry's uh, very consistent candor. Uh, sometimes when people in uh, community relations or government relations are uh, talking to others, they're um, polite in the extreme, they may resort to euphemisms, they may not really uh, sort of be as plain spoken as the occasion requires. And I never had that issue with uh, Sherry, she was always very direct with me. Uh, and uh, in my observation and conversation with others, um, that candor uh, was sort of the hallmark of her work. She spoke truth to power when she needed to do so. She gave hard, candid answers when that's what was called for. Uh, and she uh, called him as she saw him, uh, at least from her perspective. My own personal example is a conversation we had a few years back, and uh, we were talking about the work uh, that our two organizations did together and my work here at the county, and Sherry was recalling that I had a long ago first term on the Board of Supervisors, and she said, I hope you won't take offense, but you're better at this job now than you were before. <laughs> and and uh, I just smiled and said, well, I would hope so. I've done it before, I'm back again. You know, you hope you get better over time. But uh, I, I took no offense because I thought uh, it was, well, in part because I thought it was accurate, but in part because I thought it was vintage Sherry. She's just gonna sort of say, you know, that was then, this is now, I think things are better. 
Um, and if things aren't better, she's going to tell you that too in a professional and respectful way. So we all understand that health care is the essential, that children's health care is a particularly challenging arena, both in terms of the cases, but also in terms of the emotions. And we should be so lucky, frankly, as to have more Sherry Sagers in our world and our lives. Uh, someone who, as I say, um, is always there for you, is uh, always going to tell you uh, what's really real and who knows what she's talking about when she shares that information with you. Would you please join me in welcoming and thanking Sherry Sager for 30 years of service. And Sherry, just so you know, it's not just me, all five of us have <laughs> given you a unanimous vote of congratulations and support. And uh, we'll do a photo in a minute, but I'd like to let you say a word or two to my colleagues and to the community if you like. Thank you. First of all, I am, I am so honored by this, and I'm very grateful because I um, actually believe in the adage that it takes a village. And, um, and it takes a village of the public, public servants, elected officials, and the community to improve our community. And um, it's a lot harder now than when I started in my career nearly 50 years ago. And so I want to just call out all of the supervisors for doing the hard work on every day. For me, being able to work at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital has literally been a labor of love. It's allowed me to pursue my passion of public service in a quasi-public entity and to do something for the most vulnerable among us, children, especially children with health care needs and special health care needs. So I am grateful. I am grateful for the partnership. I am grateful, Joe, to your leadership on children's mental health and your support of the Alcove program, which is now a statewide model program. Um, it's about listening to people. It's about being authentic. And it's about doing it together. None of us can do this alone. So thank you very much. I am deeply honored, humbled, and grateful. Thank you, Sherry. And colleagues, Madam President, if we could bring board members down for a, a photo uh, and say thank you once more. Can you manage that? It's part of the Such a big smile, Sherry has just been such a tremendous mentor and, and leader and advocate. Um, really wonderful to be able to do this for you today, Sherry. Item six is public comment. This is the portion of the agenda set aside for members of the public wishing to address the board on matters that are not on today's agenda, but are within the purview of the Board of Supervisors. If you're intending to speak on public comment, you should have turned in a yellow card Yellow cards can be found in the back of the room. I will close the queue when the first speaker begins speaking. So if you haven't put in a card yet and you do intend to speak, uh, really now is the moment to go over and get one. 
I will give us a second for that to happen. And for those of you on Zoom, now is the time uh, to raise your virtual hand. I'm going to close both queues when the first speaker begins speaking for management, uh, time management purposes, so I understand um, what, we, what we have today. So, Anjane, could you let me know how many speakers we have who have submitted yellow cards in chambers and how many are currently raising their hands on Zoom? We have 22 speaker cards in chambers and currently 15 hands raised in Zoom. Okay, let's give that a second. Again, I'm gonna close both queues. Are we holding at 15? We are holding at 15. Okay, then we're gonna close that queue at 15, this one at 22, and we will offer each speaker one minute, and uh, the clerk will call your names in groups of five, so if you could come please line up when your name is called, we'll be able to uh, move through and have an opportunity to hear everyone. Thank you, I have Douglas Rice, Susan or Suze York, Nancy, Charlotte Casey, and Donna, please approach the podium. Supervisors, your County Airports Commission has sent five letters of transmittal to the board for your review and comment. Thus far, no response has been received. The first letter transmitted in October of last year was sent to the Hewlett, and the commission waited for it to be agendized by that body. It never was. The Commission has since sent it to the entire board for their consideration. The next four transmittals, all adopted in February, have been sent directly to the board. They deal with the MTC and the reinstatement of the Regional Airport Planning Committee, advanced air mobility and establishment of an operating plan for the county, board acceptance of the Jacobs Engineering Study on lead in the soils at the county airports, and critical information about errors in the county lead study and findings from other studies around the country that contradict the Zarin study's findings. These new studies, one in Colorado and one in Los Angeles County, found in no case, no, in one case, no detectable lead at all from the airport and the other lead levels were far below levels found elsewhere in the county. It's imperative that the board act in a transparent manner, review the letters, and communicate your comments to the airport commission and the public. Good morning, my name is Charlotte Casey. I'm with the San Jose Peace and Justice Center and I'm asking you to put on your next agenda the resolution for a ceasefire in the war in Gaza. I somehow, somehow that term ceasefire, I don't know how it happened, has become a dirty word. What kind of a world do we live in when ceasefire, which literally means stop the killing, is a word to be avoided and it's a dirty word. Stop dropping bombs, withdraw the tanks and snipers, and allow the trucks carrying food and humanitarian supplies to reach the people who are starving. You should use your status as an elected body representing the citizens of this county to raise up our voices to our government in Washington, especially to President Biden, and demand that the killing paid for by our tax dollars comes to an end. Please put the resolution for a ceasefire on the next agenda. Thank you. My name is Nancy. I urge you to pass a permanent Gaza ceasefire resolution precisely because our government has been funding the genocide in Gaza. Listen to the words of Mohammed al in Gaza, published in recent New York Times, February 6th. We are in a great famine. My children are crying from hunger all the time. People are hoping that Israel nukes us so we get rid of this pain. February 11th. Yesterday, my cousin lost her two-month-old baby because there's no milk to breastfeed him because there's nothing for her to eat. For humanity, please pass a ceasefire resolution. Good morning, 
I am here today speaking about a genocide in Gaza. It is intentional ethnic cleansing through intentional starvation and withholding of food for Palestinians. No child, no child should look to the sky and wonder if what's falling is death or dinner. What, what if your child was under the rubble? Think about that. I'm so appalled by the double standards here, not getting involved in foreign policy. You were all happy to step in when Ukraine was being bombed. Stop with the double standards. The largest World War II ghetto housed over half a million Jews. They were forced to leave their ha homes with what they could carry, starved and exterminated. History is repeating itself, itself here. Can you see the pattern? Let's end this apartheid and please add a ceasefire to the resolution. Thank you. Thank you. I'll call the next five speakers. I have a Charlotte, Rick, Kay, Jonah, and Bill. Hello, my name's Susie, and I'm the president of RMPA. I'm here because RMPA is issuing a vote of no confidence for Kim Walker, who is the current nurse manager for the sexual assault forensics exam program. RMPA has received several complaints about Kim Walker, filed grievances against her, issued a cease and desist letter and met with labor relations regarding her misrepresentations. And Kim Walker has created an environment that is toxic, hostile, and intimidating. Her offensive behavior led to the filing of a whistleblower report and has caused the program to suffer a high turnover. Therefore, the Registered Nursing Professional Association has no confidence in Kim Walker's ability to properly lead and administer the Crucial Safe program and recommend that this, the County of Santa Clara seek new leadership for its mismanagement and oversight. It's a sh shame that I have to come before you because hospital le leadership refuses to do something. Thank you. Next speaker, please approach the podium. Charlotte, election treason. The 2018 midterm elections, 2021 recall election, and 2022 midterm elections are all ostensibly lost in one-to-one -one balloting. But actually, with the help of a fraudulent elect electronic election system, an algorithm, and the actions of the globalist cartels and the CCP, a dictator was installed to oversee their province of California. Now, with the help of federal courts in the state of Georgia and their unwitting corrupted Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, the evidence is clear for the world to see how the selected treasonous governor of the province of California and thousands of down-ballot corrupted selected officials have turned to the once great state of California into a Nazi communist totalitarian province. Rick here. The election case pits an election integrity, nonprofit, and handful of Georgia voters against the Secretary of State office. They claim that the state's computerized voting machines face an unacceptable risk of being hacked, which infringes on the constitutional right of voters. The case has already made history after Totenberg ordered the state in 2019 to replace <clears throat> its previous voting machines from the Diabold election systems. Her ruling came after plaintiffs highlighted the touchscreen machine's vulnerability to be hacked. In response, Georgia bought the Dominion machines and began using them in June 2020 presidential primary. Okay. With the Dominion machines, voters use a touch screen, also called a ballot marking device, BMD, to make their choices. Then they print out their ballots, which have a QR code that a scanner reads to record and tally the votes. During the six-year case, computer scientists serving as experts for the plaintiffs have uncovered multiple specific ways that both the current Dominion and previous Diebold voting machines are vulnerable to hacking. The solution, the plaintiffs argue, is to have voters mark paper ballots by hand as nearly 70% of voters do in the rest of the country. The ballots themselves, not just a QR code, would then be scanned and a procedure known as a risk limiting audit would be used to verify the results. Thank you. Georgia is one of a handful of states that uses this same election system for all of its registered voters statewide. 
That means any problem, whether due to hacking or human error, could affect nearly 8 million votes. Many other states use a patchwork of systems. In June 2023, in the Federal District Court for the Northern District of Georgia unsealed the so-called 96-page Holderman Report. The security analysis of Georgia's in image cast x ballot marking devices. University of Michigan Professor of Computer Science and Engineering J. Alex Holderman and security researcher and assistant professor at Auburn University Drew Seringal collaborated on the report and demonstrated in court how Dominion machines are hacked and their tabulations are easily altered to select any individual for any office. I'll call the next few names in the pile. We have Patty, Karen, Sandy, Lan, and Terry. To continue, in, George, in the Georgia courtroom on January 19, 2024, J. Alex Halderman demonstrated in explicit detail to the court and to the world how easy it is to hack into the Dominion voting machine system and alter vote votes. Following the audit on the election of 2018, 21, and 22, utilizing data provided by each California county and the Secretary of State of Office, it is obvious an algorithm was used to create weighted votes, values in the Dominion and other voting tabulating devices by those who facilitated the selection of the governor. The evidence in the Georgia federal court presented by J. Alex Hollerman overwhelmingly supports the use of the algorithm to facilitate the corruption of the elect, corrupt election of the governor. The fraudulent election system does not function without the help and support of state and county employees who either knowingly or unwittingly have worked together to perpetuate the corrupt election system. It is also known that the Secretary of State of the State of Georgia, Brad Raffensperger, has visited Nevada and contacted numerous California county clerks and state officials to support their actions to continue a false narrative to the citizens of New California State and California State that the election systems are all fine. We now know the Raffensperger California County and State officials narrative is a deliberate lie. The fraudulent California election system goes back 30 years, yet the most egregious era between 2018 and 22 must be addressed. This will not be addressed by the current totalitarian communist government of California unless we, the people, act and demand the decertification of the 2018 through 22 elections now. There are legal ways to demand decertification and at the same time force counties to utilize paper ballots, same day elections, which was successfully demonstrated January 27, 2024 by the great state of New California. Hi, I'm Sandy and I work in federal law enforcement. Significance of these foundational truths in my request to you. The significance of America being a constitutional republic is that the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. Any purported law, statute, code, regulation, rule, or policy made consistently with the enumerated powers of the Constitution are presumed valid. In contrast, any purported law, statute, code, regulation, rule, mandate, or policy which opposes or violates the Constitution in any way whatsoever is unlawful, null, and void. No bureaucrat, no politician, no person acting in any official government capacity has any legal authority to restrict the constitutional rights of any law-abiding citizen. 
nor alter the count of the citizens' votes. Do you, each one of you, agree? Thank you. Foundational to our constitutional republic is that the process of voting must be free, fair, and accurate. Do you agree? The 2020 presidential election and all elections since then were touted by governments at all levels as free, fair, and the most secure elections in history. Since November 2020, little by little, the evidence has come out that these elections were not free, fair, nor secure. For example, every county registrar in the country represented that the voting machines were not connected to the internet. Since then, it has been universally admitted that the voting machines were connected to the internet, either by cable or Wi-Fi. Why counties maintain a log of those who physically access the individual machines in person? There is no record unauthorized access of the machines using Wi-Fi during non-business hours, nor why actually counting votes. Do you agree? Good morning, I'm Frank Crane. I'm here to, to speak with the Board of Supervisors in regards to the medical building that's being planned to be uh, constructed on the premises of De Anza College in the parking lot. <clears throat> My interest in this is that I'm a, one of the many vendors that appear uh, every month on the first Saturday to uh, sell our goods to people that come in it's very important for the number, the, the big number of vendors that we have that come there every month. But we believe that the uh, construction of this building on the parking lot at the De Anza will disrupt the flea market very, very desperately. Now, I don't know why the uh, Board of Supervisors has planned to build a, a medical facility in that location. It doesn't seem appropriate to me in terms of the type of clientele that you really want to cater to. Thank you. Thank you. I'll continue calling names. I have Lanley, Lindley, Lisa, Joan Simon, Nadine, and Frank Crane. If I've called your name and you have not spoken yet, please um, approach the podium. Thank you. Thank you. Since November, the 2020 elections, registrar of voters in each county nationwide represented the voting machines could not be and were not hacked. Did you or the registrar of voters in your county ever make such a representation to anyone at any time? If so, to whom and when? Are you aware that in the federal district court in Georgia, there is a case named Curling et al. versus Brad Rathensberger et al. 117 CV 10. 2989AT. Brad Raffensperger is the, is the Secretary of State for Georgia. Are you aware that during the trial in the above named case, University of Michigan professor Dr. J. Alex Halderman was able to hack an electronic voting machine with only a ballpoint pen and a card and alter the vote totals in open court as the judge watched? Are you aware that the machine hacked by Dr. Haddleman is the same type of voting machine? Can you move over to the, the microphone? County? Thank you. Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger has jointly met with the California Secretary of State Shirley Weber and registrars of voters from all California counties. Did you participate in any way in any of these meetings? Are you willing to discuss with me exactly what was discussed in these meetings? Are there any memos or emails that mention the meeting mentioned in paragraph five above? What was discussed? What, if anything, was decided? Any tasks assigned or any plan of action? Are you willing to disclose any such memos and emails by this demand for information and without order of any court? Are you aware? In the federal and state laws that there's something called racketeering influence corrupt organization, RICO? Are you aware that voters in this county generally and me specifically have been damaged by the collusion between Mr. Raffensperger, California Secretary of State Weber, and one or more registrars of voters concerning what we now know as a false narrative of the alleged integrity of the election from November 2020 to present. Please see Mosier versus Southern California Physicians, 
Insurance Exchange, 1998, 1063, Good morning. My name is Joan Simon. I am a Jewish citizen of Santa Clara County and represent the San Jose Peace and Justice Center. According to the respected Euromed Human Rights Monitor, from October 7th, 2023 to February 23rd, 2024, 38,066 people were killed in Gaza. I know you are well aware that across the world, millions of people are engaging in demonstrations and organizing major marches in ending the genocide and in solidarity with the people of Palestine. The Bay Area is unified in demanding a ceasefire, which is supported by over 66% of Americans. You are the ones who give the people of Santa Clara County the voice in demanding an immediate permanent ceasefire. It's up to you to help the people of Santa Clara County to add their voices and help the dying children of Gaza. Good morning. More than 30,000 Palestinians in Gaza have been killed. 13,000 of these are children. An American doctor who just returned from Gaza said, what I saw wasn't war, it was annihilation. While a San Jose-based doctor currently on a medical mission in Gaza described one hospital as packed with children with gunshot wounds in the back and the neck. The silence despite the sheer level of violence impacting the residents of Santa Clara County is happening in several ways. One friend of mine has lost over 80 family members in Gaza. Students, untenured faculty, workers, allies, activists in our community are experiencing intimidation, doxing, and censorship while speaking out against this violence. Months ago, the Santa Clara Human Relations Commission sent a powerful recommendation to the Board of Supervisors here to ask them to call for a ceasefire and, in and implement anti-hate policies just as you had done for Ukraine. Silence on this matter when the majority of the community is unified in demanding a ceasefire is not acceptable. Add a ceasefire resolution to the next agenda. Thank you. Thank you. I'll call the last two cards um, that were submitted for item six. We have Debbie Chang and Alan Kamara. We also have a handful of cards of speakers who have not yet spoken. If I've called your name and you haven't spoken, please approach the podium. Good morning, my name is Debbie Chang. I am an RMPA consultant. Do you know that Santa Clara County Health and Hospital System has been deliberately, consistently, and knowingly violating the California State Nurse to Patient Racial Law, which dictates the nurse staffing based on acuity? Despite the repeated meetings and communication regarding this violation, no corrective action has been taken place. The staffing levels, according to the RMPA contract under Section 1812, under dispute resolution, clearly states when there is a dispute regarding the staffing concern that cannot be resolved at the Acuity Task Force, such concern shall be subject to an internal review by the Management Audit Division for the Board of Supervisors. Viol violating the patient acuity equates to unpaid, uh, unsafe patient care. Violating the nurse to patient staffing law threatens the nurses' working conditions. We stand united with our nurses. Thank you. Good morning, Supervisor. My name is Alan Kamar. Um, it's no fun to come in front of you all the time here to speak to you all. I just want to echo the sentiment from our previous president, Debbie Chen, and also our current president, Susie York. Um, we're here standing in solidarity with our nurses at the Sexual Assault Forensic Examination Program. The manager over there has been horrible. We just don't come to you because we want to. It's because 
We've used every channel possible, all chain of command to address this issue and we have failed. And we wanna to come to you to put it on the record that we have no confidence in our leadership and we ask you to look for a different leadership. And on the last note, RMPA do not wanna strike. The county has again failed to meet us. We do not want to strike. We want the community to know that. Thank you. I've called all names of those who have submitted speaker cards. Great. Let's move then to the speakers on Zoom. Okay. We'll begin with Kenneth. We've allowed you to unmute. Please accept. You may begin. Kenneth, we see you're unmute, but we cannot hear you. Kenneth? Okay, we will go to the next speaker and try Kenneth again. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead. Yes, yeah, sorry. Dr. Ken Horowitz of the Health Advisory Commission, I'd like to invite the health policy aides to attend our health advisory commission meeting um, a week from Wednesday at 6.30 in your chambers. Uh, we'll be discussing dental care. We have um, approximately 500,000 Medi-Cal recipients. Only 20% are getting an annual dental visit. That means approximately 400,000 of our county residents do not get their teeth cleaned. This is a real problem and creates dental infections and dental pain. So I would like to have your health policy aides attend our health advisory commission meeting next uh, Wednesday at 630. Finally, this is a message directed at Supervisor Sumidian. Please call me or contact me regarding the West Valley Health Clinic. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, Camila or Camilla, please unmute. Yes, uh, I hope you can hear me. Yeah. I, called the, I called Supervisor Sylvia Arena's office uh, many times about the situation in Gaza. The meeting has not been scheduled yet with her. I was told several times to attend the supervisor meeting and make my public comments. So here I am. I'm asking you to add the uh, resolution for ceasefire in Gaza in the uh, next meeting's agenda. What is happening in Gaza is a genocide, and our moral duty is to not be complicit in it, at least denounce it, especially that this genocide is made possible by the U.S. using U.S. arms against U.S. law and against international law. It is carried with our tax dollars against our will, and it has been allowed to continue with the U.S. veto against the entire world. We, U.S. citizens of... Thank you. The next speaker is Gail Ann. Please accept the unmute, and you may begin. Good morning. Um, um, I know by now you've all heard about the mess at Branham in Monterey, um, which is a big mess for the unhoused. First off, I want to thank you all for the uh, funding of the four million. But I do want to, hopefully, the city and the county will work together on looking into this mess. I was on a call last night with the mayor for, um, anyway, um, he wants to hold the developers accountable, inspect the units. Let's inspect every unit. Unit. I know that's going to be a big job, but if it rains, you know, and they still have mold, this is not acceptable. Um, it's unfortunate because a lot of the unhoused were going to be getting into that site. Now, I don't know what's going to happen, um, but we need to inspect every unit and we need to hold the people accountable for our um, unhoused. Thank you so much. The next speaker, Jessica. Please accept the unmute and you may begin. Dear supervisors, dear supervisors, you may have received several public comments regarding John Nicholas Trail Parking. John Nicholas tops the list of favorite trails for hikers, bikers, and dog walkers, and is the best new trail built in a decade. 
This weekend, I was excited to bring my youth mountain bike team to John Nicholas for practice. However, my kids had to ride on the road for a mile before they could access the trails. Our coaches and kids were nervous as they had to traverse on Black or Sanborn Road, both of which are dangerous two-lane curvy roads with no shoulders, lots of blind spots, and cars speeding by. Parking restrictions have recently been imposed on both the roads, resulting in trail users needing to walk or ride on the road to access the trails. Please look into this and help us find a better, safer parking solution that would increase, not decrease, access to these trails before somebody gets hurt walking on these roads trying to access the trail. Thank you. Thank you. Dina is next. Please unmute. Hi, my name is Dina, and I'm here to urge you to add a ceasefire resolution to your next meeting agenda. I'm Palestinian American Christian and have family currently sheltering in the churches. A number of them were killed when the third oldest Orthodox church was bombed. The situation in Gaza right now is extremely dire. The people in Gaza, including my family, are not just starving, but they're actually intentionally being starved to death. In recent weeks, a number of Palestinian children have been killed, and I say killed, not just died, but killed because of the malnutrition and starvation. The first step to address this is a ceasefire. It's plain and simple. In what modern times is this acceptable? A ceasefire will, allow, will ensure that we allow adequate humanitarian aid and medical aid to enter. We need to do this just like you did for you. The next speaker is Mimi. Hello, do you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, I want to echo the other speakers uh, who asked for a ceasefire for, to be added to the agenda. Please do add it. Listen to the diverse community who asked you uh, to add a ceasefire resolution to your agenda and adopt that. You not, your silence means you are taking the side of genocide. 40,000 indigenous people of Palestine were killed by Israel, funded by our tax dollars. The school year was canceled in Gaza because the students were killed. 100,000 lost their legs and eyes, or eyes, paid by U.S. tax dollars. Israel received 30 billion U.S. dollars to commit a genocide. We need these dollars. These dollars can solve all education problems in the United States. Only $20 billion can solve the entire homelessness problem in the United States. We are not, we're not benefiting at all from this irrational relationship. Thank you. We have South Bay JVP next. Please unmute. Hi, um, my name is Wendy Greenfield. I'm a Jewish woman who is grief-stricken by the horrors the people of Gaza are undergoing, with over 31,000 people, including 12,000 children killed and over 72,000 wounded. Gaza is now facing starvation. Jewish tradition teaches that destroying one human life is tantamount to destroying an entire world. We are all responsible to speak out to stop genocide. Rabbis for Ceasefire supports cities, counties, and municipalities of all sizes across the country who are passing resolutions calling for a ceasefire. We pray that those in power hear the calls of the masses of people saying in one voice, ceasefire now, may not another life be lost. They also call for civil discourse in which all views are thoughtfully considered and people are treated with respect. Please agendize a ceasefire resolution and work to stop hate incidents against Muslims, Jews, and Palestinians. For you. The next speaker is Nicholas. Hello. In Auschwitz, 127 children were killed on a daily basis. In Gaza, the World Health Organization states that over 160 children are killed on a daily basis, and you have done nothing. Months ago, the Santa Clara Human Relations Commission sent a powerful recommendation for the Board of Supervisors to call for a ceasefire and for anti-hate policies, just as you have done for Ukraine, both for the end of the extreme violence against the Palestinian people and for the safety and sanity of the affected and empathetic communities in the Bay Area. To say that these motions passed here do not affect the community or mean nothing 
would be no different than telling black men and women in Jim Crow South that there is no need to condemn lynch mobs as they parade the streets. There is still no justice for the Stanford student who was run over by an anti-Arab member of this county. This time stop being complacent and complicit and show Arabs in Santa Clara that their, act, that their lives matter with action. Just as the next speaker is Kay. Please unmute and you may begin. Hi, my name is Kay. I've been a resident, um, born and raised in Eastside San Jose for my whole life. As a Vietnamese American, I would like to ask the Board of Supervisors to add a ceasefire resolution, an immediate um, ceasefire resolution to the agenda for next week. Um, as a Vietnamese American, my whole family has been ransacked by war. Um, and as I'm seeing the uh, genocide on Gaza unfold, I think it is incredibly important for the Board of Supervisors to take a stand and at least add the ceasefire resolution onto the agenda, as well as to call for a ceasefire immediately. Um, I have been very proud of the Board of Supervisors in the past in Santa Clara County. I think that they have done incredible work and have done a lot of great things for the people of San Jose as well as other areas in the Santa Clara County. And I think that the fact that there's been nothing said on Gaza so far is a shame to the work and to the people of Santa Clara County. I think there needs to be a ceasefire resolution added immediately to end all suffering. In the next speaker is Alisar. Hello, I'm asking you to also agendize a resolution demanding an immediate and permanent ceasefire in Gaza. In the last five months, over 12,000 children in Gaza have been killed. They have been killed by bombs paid for by our American tax dollars, not a trivial portion of which comes from Santa Clara County taxpayers. While they were dying and continue to die by bomb or starvation, our American government has vetoed every UN Security Council resolution calling for an immediate and permanent ceasefire. Can you acknowledge that there is something very wrong with our tax dollars being used to kill 12,000 children in five months? You are our electeds. You represent us. President Biden and his administration need to know it's wrong and unacceptable. Please agendize a ceasefire resolution. Thank you. The next speaker is a user by the name W. Smith. Hello. I'm, I'm urging the board to call for a ceasefire. More than 40,000 people have been killed, 14,000 of those being children. And just this month, 21 kids who have died from mal have killed from malnutrition and starvation. Their bodies like sticks, nothing in their bodies. If you see those images, it will remind you of a Holocaust. It's a minimal ask, a minimal a recognition of Palestinian humanity. The ceiling of their hope at this hour is for the bombing to stop. Despite Israel cutting power and internet, Palestinians have managed to live stream a picture of their own genocide to a world that allows it to continue. I urge the board to not be silent on this. Silence is complicity. Our US tax dollars have funded this genocide. Please speak up. Thank you. The next speaker is Donya. Please unmute. Good morning. I'm also here to ask you that you please agendize a ceasefire resolution. In the last five months in Gaza, more children, more journalists, more medical and United Nations staff have been killed than anywhere in the world in a conflict in only five months. This is the most documented genocide in history, a genocide that our tax money is funding tax money that should be going to our own citizens. Allowing this genocide to continue only brings more anger, hatred, and violence. And without acknowledging humanity and calling for a ceasefire here at a local level, I feel it will be an impossible feat. Funding weapons, death, and starvation never and will never bring peace. Please, I beg you to use your voices to bring that change we desperately need and to help end the bloodshed taking place with our hard-earned tax money. I plead with you to put a resolution for a ceasefire on the next agenda. Thank you. Omar is our next speaker. Hi, my name is Omar. I'm a first generation uh, Palestinian American, originally from Gaza. Um, over the last five months, my family has lost dozens of relatives. Every family that I know 
in my local network here in the Bay Area with family in Gaza has lost many relatives. My aunt, the most recent casualty we have is my aunt. She died of multiple health conditions she cannot get treatment for. She needed kidney dialysis. She was diabetic and she had a lung infection. She can get any treatment for that. And eventually, because of not being able to excrete any waste, it hit her, hit her bloodstream, her limbs swelled up liquid, and she passed away. A very preventable death. I urge you to agendize a ceasefire resolution. You failed to speak up for the last five months, but let's focus on moving forward. We all have family left, and let's focus on stopping things as soon as possible to preserve their lives, all innocent life. Thank you. Our next speaker is Paul Soto. Please unmute. Uh, good morning, uh, Paul Soto. First of all, I'd like to announce to the board that speakers between 1030 and 1035, those five speakers, I would ask that they be allowed to put their statements on record again because the recording stopped. Between 1030 and 1035 at this meeting, the recording stopped, which means that those citizens' uh, public comment was not recorded into the record. So I'm asking that those five speakers from 1030 to 1035 be allowed to, to put their statements on record. Secondly, I'm, um, if what is happening now was happening to the Jew, would our response as a, as a citizenry, which you are representative of, would our response be different? And if not, if it, if it would be different, then why are we experiencing the kind of indifference and apathy from our representatives? Something to the last speaker who had their hand raised at the call of the queue, Aram, please unmute. Good morning. I have read, good morning. I wrote a very uh, a letter to Supervisor Ellenberg, Chair Ellenberg, on March first, twenty twenty four. With my phone number, I know you personally. We've talked on a number of police reform matters over the years. I've had no response. I've demanded that you put a ceasefire resolution on the Board of Supervisors agenda. I, a 75-year-old Jewish man who strongly opposes the terrorist state of Israel, the bombing by the U.S. government, the complicity of the U.S. government. And now, if you remain silent, Supervisor Ellenberg, and the rest of the board, then you are complicit in the war crimes that are occurring daily. If you look at Richmond Newspapers versus Virginia, the absolute most important place for these kind of discussions to occur is in the town square, right here. If you want to avoid vigilanteism and alternative acts, you do your job and have this discussion now. End this. And that was our last speaker. Thank you very much, and thank you to everyone who came uh, this morning, either in person or on Zoom, to share uh, to share your opinions and reflections. We're going to we're going to move to item seven, which is approval of the consent calendar, and we will begin um, by asking the clerk to review the current status of the. Thank you. Uh, first, there are items on the consent calendar that may be subject to the Levine Act. As indicated in the language on the published agenda, any party or their agents must disclose on record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member, as described on page three of the agenda. Participants who have a financial interest and their agents are requested to make a similar disclosure. For the consent calendar, we have a request from Supervisor Chavez to hold item 15 to April 16th. Item 15 is a report relating to the status of Reed Hillview Airport, unleaded fuel advocacy, and for East Ridge Little League community serving transportation options and possible planning and community engagement for future uses of the airport site. We also have a correction to item number 27. The possible action A should reflect a requirement for a four-fifths vote and should read as follows. A, approve request for appropriation modification number 174 for $17,019, transferring funds from the general fund contingency reserve to the proba probation department budget relating to the reclassification of management aid to management analysts. Four-fifths vote. 
We also have a request from Supervisor Aranis to remove item 34 from the consent count calendar. Item 34 is to consider recommendations relating to the fiscal year 24 through 25 budget process. We have a request from administration to hold item number 55 to a date uncertain. Item 55 are recommendations relating to the agreement with Stronghold Engineering Inc. We also have a correction to item number 63. The item should read as follows. Final adoption of executive leadership salary ordinance number NS-20.23.09, an ordinance amending Santa Clara County salary ordinance NS-20.23, relating to compensation of employees deleting three CSCHS chief operating officer positions and adding three SCVH hospital executive operations positions, retitling the classification of the CSCHS chief operating officer to SCVH chief operating officer, increasing the salary range from the SCVH chief operating officer classification by 10%, deleting the footnote number eight, providing for a 10% differential for one employee in the classification of CSCVH chief operating officer when performing the duties of the enterprise chief, adjusting the salary range of the director emergency medical services classification, deleting one specialty care medical director position, five patient quality and safety medical director positions, one chief medical information officer position, one perioptive services medical director position, one utilization and valuation medical director position, one whole person care medical director position, one primary care medical director position, and two behavioral health medical director positions, and adding 13 CSCHS medical executive positions, deleting one director children, youth, and family system of care position, and one director access and unplanned services position, retitling the classification of director adult, older adult system of care to director system of care, and adding two director system of care positions in the County of Santa Clara Health System. And that concludes the consent calendar updates. Thank you very much. I'll go first to Supervisor Simidian and then Lee. Thank you, uh, Madam President. <clears throat> We've been advised that certain items on the consent calendar today may be subject to the Levine Act as indicated in the language on our published agenda. Specifically, we've been advised that items 20, 29, 30, 35, 39, 49, 50, 51, 53, 54, and 55 on the consent calendar may be subject to the Levine Act. We've also been advised that pursuant to state law, any party or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member as described on page three of our agenda. So I want to ask at this time that if any party or agent has made such a contribution that they disclose that contribution immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. I would also ask that if any participant in these proceedings has made such a contribution that they disclose that contribution immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. And I would also ask that if any employee of the county council's office or of the clerk of the board's office or any other member of county staff or any member of the public knows of any reason I should recuse myself under the Levine Act, that they please disclose that information immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Supervisor Lee. Thank you, President. Um, first, I would like to uh, make a correction. I'm not uh, trying to make any removal, but add a correction to item 19B. Uh, on the minutes from the Board of Supervisors agenda on February 27th. Under item 32, it should read as follows. Quote, at the request of Vice President Lee, the Board directed County Council to report to the Board on dates uncertain relating to the scope of Board authority regarding behavioral health rich housing revenue and expenditure appropriations by visiting independent living locations, understanding extent of problems, and ensuring facilities are habitable, unquote. For item number 45H currently on the consent, I just would like to uh, mention that for the pro proclamation of the Persian New Year and recognizing the history of the Iranian American community, uh, next week marks the start of the Persian New Year, known as Nowruz, and I want to thank Suzanne Mantegi Safakish uh, for bringing this proclamation forward for me to share with the board for their approval. 
I also want to acknowledge those who have co-sponsored this proclamation, including State Senator Aisha Wahab, Senate Cruz City Councilmember Shabrak Kalantari Johnson, uh, the Bay Area Iranian American Democrats, Iranian Scholarship Fund, Voices of Women for Change, and the Safakish family. And I'm certainly leaving that on the consent, and that's all I have. Thank you very much, President. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you, um, and thank you for bringing item 45 forward, and Susanna, it's good to see you, and you're, you're happy here today. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, first I, I wanted to thank Supervisor Arenas for pulling item 34. I also want to uh, discuss that item. And I'd like to ask staff if, the, um, if we could pull item 46 as well. And this is a report from Planning and OSH on the housing element. And I just briefly wanted to ask some updated questions relative to the future housing elements. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Great. I, I don't have any changes, but just a couple of um, brief uh, comments and, and words of, of appreciation. With regard to item 23, I want to thank Public Health and ESA uh, for your swift action in addressing uh, the positions to ensure that there won't be any gaps in care. Uh, this move also reduces the general fund dependency and maintains compliance with federal uh, Ryan White funding. So just thank you for moving swiftly on that. Item 27 is a salary ordinance uh, result. <laughs> item 27 is a salary ordinance resulting from a classification study. I have no objection um, to that. I just want to make a, a general comment about the budget. Um, since I, I'm aware, as we all are, that departmental budget reductions are currently being evaluated. Um, and I know this has brought up, have been brought up before as well, but I just want to call attention to the potential long-term impact of reductions um, in, such, as, such as those are being proposed in the probation department. And I think that as much as possible, we need to identify reductions that don't erode services that are provided to re-entry clients and individuals in our custody, particularly those in the juvenile system, or we're just going to continue to to see an increase in the amount of money that we have to spend repeatedly to hold people uh, in custody. It, it should certainly be our priority to maintain education, job training, and all of those individual supports that we've seen to have significant downstream effects um, in areas like uh, recidivism, again, which would be ultimately more costly to address. Item 62 is the salary ordinance for the caregiver return to work program. I'm pleased to see this. At the last meeting, a representative from the Park Rangers Association shared concerns about potential eligible positions in their department, and um, the board agreed that it would be fine to omit those positions at their request. That's not reflected in the ordinance that was submitted with the budget. So um, I'm asking if there is either an updated version of the ordinance that, that reflects that correction. The Park Ranger 2-1 uh, list on the ordinance should just be struck, and I think that can just be noted in the record. Okay, then I would include that with the motion for approval of the consent calendar that the Park Ranger position be, be struck. Um, so we have a motion and a second. Let's go to public comment, and then we'll vote on the consent calendar. Do we have speakers in chambers and or on Zoom? Yes, we do. I have a speaker by the name, I believe it's Susan Sapfa. So, sorry, let's just talk numbers first. How many speakers do we have in chambers? Just one, one. and one on Zoom. Okay, so note again for, for both cues, we'll, we'll close them when the, when the first speaker begins. So if you are on Zoom, please raise your hand now. If you're in chambers intending to speak and you don't have a yellow card submitted, please get that right now. Again, the speaking cues will close when the first speaker begins speaking and with two speakers. Um, I'm pleased that we can offer two minutes for each speaker. Will Susan approach the podium? First of all, <clears throat> good morning to all. Um, Nowruz is a widely celebrated festival among more than 300 million individuals 
residing in Middle East, Central Asia, South Asia, Caucasus, Crimea, and Balkan region, and Black Sea. Specifically in Iran and Afghanistan, customs and practices related to Nowruz have been deeply ingrained within these communities for over 3,000 years. Nowruz also presents an opportunity to reflect on the year that has passed. Its positive message of rejuvenation crosses many cultural, linguistic, and political boundaries. As we commemorate this joyous holiday that makes the arrival of spring and new life, we extend our gratitude to Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors for acknowledging this peaceful celebration. In particular, we would like to express our appreciation our appreci appreciation towards Supervisor Lees and his team, as well as his chief of staff, Wendy Hu, for, for all their generous support. Furthermore, we recognize President Ellenberg attending ISF Nowruz event on March 10th. Thank you. Regardless of where you celebrate this festival and this wonderful occasion, we hope you are blessed by the coming of the new year with thank the you, renewed Susan. energy and health. Thank you and so much, thank Susan. you. And our Zoom speaker, please. Paul Soto, please accept the MU. Uh, good morning, Paul Soto. Um, uh, my comments are referencing uh, item 15, um, holding it over to April. Uh, thank you for that. That's gonna give a little bit more time. I'd like to bring in uh, Councilman Candelas on that particular issue that I, I, I think maybe if we can create that, that, that synergy of support for the Eastridge Little League team to, to bring down some of those costs. Again, I'd like to reinforce that they were removed from Hillview Airport. I already know why, so that's that the, the reasons why are not the issue. What is that issue is the fact that they incurred a $10,000 um, debt automatically because that's how much it costs to rent the field. As a result of that, they had, they had to progressively increase the amount that a kid would have to pay in order to play, and that's $200. This $200 for these families in the East Ridge Little League to play, that, 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 that's, that's a lot of money for a parent to just fork out for one child. You know, what if they have two or three kids that want to play ball? And, you know, how are they going to pick just one? They can't. So there's a lot of untapped talent um, that is not being accessed or accessible to a population that we say that we want to protect. The reason why we're trying to close it is because of unleaded fuel to protect the children. Well, I think we also owe it to these, these kids to protect them and their parents from exorbitant costs to offset that cost. I think we, I think we need to assume a responsibility for that. And it's $10,000, but maybe we can even do more, you know, to really mitigate those costs for those kids um, trying to play. And so I'm asking that you can keep that uppermost in mind when this item does come up, because I'm gonna try to get the president of the, uh, of the. Thank you, that was our only speaker for item seven. Thank you so much. I wanna just make one um, a quick amendment to my motion. Um, and I would recommend that the board take up, if, if um, this meets your needs, Supervisor Chavez, item 46 um, immediately after, uh, on the housing element, right after item 14, uh, which is the Williamson Act, just because planning folks will already be here. Great, and that's all right with a seconder? Okay, excellent, let's vote please. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Yes. Vice President Lee? <laughs> and President Ellenberg? Yes. Motion passes.
Thank you very much. Good teamwork and delay there. Um, item eight uh, is a public hearing on the purchase of real property at 9460 No Name Uno Gilroy. Um, I will invite our presenters, then I will open the public hearing. Good morning, Jeff Graper, Facilities and Fleet Department. Thank you. Are there any introductory remarks you want to make, or are you available uh, just I'm for available questions? I'm available for questions, Supervisor. All right, then I'm going to open the public hearing on this item. Do we have speakers? I have no speakers in chambers and no hands raised. Then I'm closing the public comment, public hearing, and turning to my colleagues for a motion, second, and any comments. Motion to approve. Second. So we have a motion by Arenas, a second by Chavez, a question by Lee. Yes, good morning, uh, Mr. Draper, good morning. Um, looking at the report, this was a piece of property that was sold in November 2020 for uh, 9.95, almost $10 million. And today we're voting to spend $14 million, or up to $14 million on it. Uh, that's 40% more than what we could have paid for uh, a few years ago. Again, real estate do go up, but so my concern here, of course, is we do not want to overpay, especially if we're buying it from bankruptcy, right, in the auction process. So I just want to clarify, this is a not to exceed authority. In other words, we could still pay a lot less than that. It just depends on what the auction is. Am I correct? It, You're it, correct, it, Supervisor. Yeah, and if I can just add, it is. Um, and since it's potentially a property that could go to auction, uh, we want to make sure we have authority and also keep other bidders guessing where we might choose to land. Right, but that does not mean we will pay $14 million. That's the whole point. So I just want to make it very clear. I don't want people to uh, expect that this is how much the county will pay. No, um, it's, a, it's a not to exceed amount. Exactly. Okay, that's all I'm going to clarify. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to say how much I appreciate the staff um, being opportunistic and doing what we need to do to both protect and expand the services that are needed in this area. And I know we've had our eye on a number of properties in this area, so I really appreciate you leaning in um, on this. I, I just wanted to better understand the um, the, desig the designation of it, the zoning of it. What, a, what it says here is that the property is owned park public facility. And what I wanted to understand are the that relative to the public quasi public facility, I'm not understanding the dis the um, the implications of that for this particular piece of property. Supervisor, I'm going to have to say I don't know, and I'm going to have to get back to you off uh, agenda in some way on that. Part of the reason I'm asking is it 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 could have a bearing on the um, on the value of it as well, and also want to better understand the implications relative to utilization of the property. Now, I'm assuming that if it's a wholly owned county site, that we have the opportunity to do the planning ourselves and permit ourselves for this kind of property because it would be primarily a public use. Is that accurate? Y yes, that is accurate. Um, you know, currently it's used as a medical office building with 17 suites in it. I think at the outset of uh, ownership of the property, if we're so lucky to get that, uh, we would continue to use it that way and then develop it over time. So um, what I would just ask is if the board could get an off-agenda informational item, just responding to that would be helpful. And I don't know if you, I, I see there's no phoning friends, like no one's rushing up to help you there, Jeff. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna just let that go and say um, thank you, and and I appreciate the flexibility and the the structure at which you're approaching this. Thank you. Uh, we neglected to make the required Levine Act announcement, so I'm going to turn to the clerk and then to Supervisor Smidian. Thank you. Item number eight is subject to the Levine Act. Any party or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member as described on page three of the agenda. Participants who have a financial interest and their agents are requested to make a similar disclosure. Thank you. Supervisor Smidian. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we have been advised that this item uh, may be subject to the Levine Act, as indicated in the language on our published agenda, and we've also been advised that pursuant to state law, 
Any party or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member uh, as described on page three of our agenda. So I want to ask at this time that if any party or agent has made such a contribution, that they disclose that contribution immediately so that I might promptly recuse myself. And I would also ask that if any participant in these proceedings, as defined by the Levine Act, has made such a contribution, that they disclose that contribution immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. And finally, I would ask that if any employee of, of the county council's office or the clerk of the board's office or any other member of county staff or any member of the public for that matter knows of any reason I should recuse myself under the Levine Act, that they please disclose that information immediately so that I might promptly recuse myself. Thank you. Thank you. We have a motion by Arenas, a second by Chavez. Let's vote, please. Oh. Supervisor Madam Arenas. President. Oh, yes, please. So sorry. Thank you for allowing me to make public comment. I know that there isn't a mention in the St. Louis um, Hospital Master Plan, uh, the St. Louis Mas uh, Master Plan, but I know that part of um, the administration's efforts is to continue to um, acquire and further expand and support um, medical care for our South County residents. And so I'm, I'm really happy that, um, just like uh, Supervisor um, Chavez said, being opportunistic isn't so bad. Um, at, uh, especially during these times, I think this is going to be a great um, acquisition. I, I believe it's like a minute away from the hospital. Um, it already has uh, medical uh, purposes and, um, and uh, we'll get that question, I think, answered for, for you as well as for the rest of us because I, I'm also curious about um, the different kind of zoning, even though there's an, a pharmacy on site and we lease medical offices. Um, those, those pictures that we received in the report were, uh, or at least there was a, a, a resident who I believe works there, um, had already given us a bit of a heads up and we had connected um, to administration. So we knew that, there, that uh, the building was gonna be up for auction um, and um, and I know that it's not in the best uh, condition, but it is already in the right place and we can get it to, um, um, to, a, to a place where it's uh, deemed um, respectful and, and, uh, and has a level of dignity for our patients out there. And so I have a lot of, uh, a lot of confidence that we'll get there. So anyways, good luck in the auction and, um, and that's it, thank you. Thank you, looks like we're ready to vote. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Sumidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. And President Ellenberg? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Item nine is a referral from Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. So um, I, first I, I just wanna say, um, Supervisor Ellenberg, how much I appreciate that you um, asked to be on the reentry committee. I remember when I got here, um, I was, it was sort of given to me because there was not as much interest. So the fact that we got you really made a big difference, I think, in the overall committee. Um, we want to make some changes so that we're better able to, um, uh, better able to meet, make sure we have quorum. And so this referral uh, should help us do that. We want to delete seats five and 14 and effectively de um, deleting another seat by replacing seven and seat 25 with one seat. And um, uh, we wanna make sure that we're, uh, let me just make sure I'm getting those numbers right. Uh, and just as a reminder for colleagues, th this committee was established to reduce recidivism and promote public safety by linking folks who are coming out of custody and ex-offenders to services so they could transition into society and become self-sufficient. And, um, and yet we, we still have a, a challenge with a quorum and all the chief of corrections and the director of employee services are two seats that do not need to be part of the committee and that's why we're deleting them. Um, I am challenged to be honest with you that um, we have members of the committee who co consistently don't show up for meetings and one of the reasons that's um, a problem is that when we're in those meetings, to not have a staff person that's leading an agency that you can turn to and say, what can you do, is really um, been very disappointing. Um, and so to that end, we wanna remove um, uh, the public health position from that department. And also, 
we are really anxious to have behavioral health be present more often because again I think that is helpful to have a consistent person who will attend. So if folks need to or want to reshape who the representative is, that's that's fine. And I again want to say that I think the committee's effectiveness and success really is rooted in having people it, there who can answer questions and then make decisions relatively quickly in terms of our being able to respond to the public safety needs of the community and really help people be successful. So I think, um, um, just as a reminder, we're gonna also, we're gonna remove seat five because we don't have a chief of correction anymore. I think that's right. I think that was Jeff for a while. Okay, thanks Kavita. And then re remove number item 14, I mean seat number 14, and then to uh, replace seat seven and seat 25 with one seat representing the health system. And that would be my motion. A second. Supervisor Lee, additional comments? Yeah, I just want to say that um, in general, this county has so many boards and commissions and committee and task forces. And it's great that we have so many individuals in our county that's willing to serve um, to better our uh, system as a whole. The problem sometimes is when we have so many of these boards and commissions, uh, folks being appointed are not showing up. And I think it's Woody Allen that says that the success of his life is based on the fact that nine of 10 is just for showing up. And when folks cannot show up, it's not just they're not showing up. We have a quorum requirement under the Brown Act, which means they can't even have the meeting being conducted. And that really uh, uh, sets us back in terms of getting things done. We've seen that in various different commissions and committees and some of our sister county commissions as well. So we are really needing to make sure that A, people show up, and B is if we have too many seats, we really need to prune those. So I just want to say thank you for putting forth these, uh, these changes. And hopefully by making these deletions, we will be able to get better participation and, and of course, the quorum being made easier so that the, the work could be done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have public speakers on this item? I do not. I see one hand raised in Zoom. All right. No speakers in chambers looking around. Let's uh, offer our single speaker two minutes, please. Paul Soto, please accept the unmute. Uh, thank you. Um, as a recipient of the services of the Reentry Center for uh, since its inception until uh, I'm very, very glad to announce that I'm no longer in need of the, the service under probation. Um, but uh, I, I want to thank the uh, supervisors for, for ensuring that a quorum is met. This, the, the issues that are, are, are kind of hashed out within the context of this meeting are very, very important. They have, an, they have a direct immediate impact on the ability for the services that the reentry provides to be maximized in order to make that integration of, of the citizen back into the community to make that possible. And that's, that's like critically important because it can reduce crime. And if it reduces crime, then, then that means there are less victims within the community. And also what it does is it, it, it signals to the inmate that he is somebody that is worth an investment. And that's a very significant paradigm shift in the way that um, we, we thought about corrections from the past. Now, I, I've been, I have the perspective of being able to see both sides because I come from the generation of lock them up, throw away the key, and once we got out, we were done. We didn't have no jobs, we didn't have no support, we didn't have nothing. We we're given a list of shelters, good luck and goodbye. And don't violate, and don't be late, or we're gonna lock you up. I mean, this was the kind of attitude. And, and, and if you had that kind of attitude at the reentry center, you would get fired. You would get fired on the spot today if you had that kind of attitude towards somebody that was being released. And so you can, we can congratulate ourselves as a community because we have instituted this kind of uh, a committee in order to ensure that something like that never happens. So thank you. That was our only speaker. Thank you, we have a motion and a second. Let's vote on this, please. Supervisor Rennes. Yes. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Smidian. Aye. Vice President Lee. Aye. President Ellenberg. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Item uh, 10 is a referral from Supervisor Smidian. 
Thank you, uh, Madam President. Uh, let me begin by thanking Supervisor Chavez for co-authoring the referral with me and by offering a motion to approve the recommended action as contained in item number 10 at packet page 35. Second. And uh, speaking just briefly to the motion, uh, Madam President, uh, essentially what we have here is a um, direction to our county staff to request, uh, if possible, to become a bona fide party to the proceeding to advocate on behalf of the county's interests and the interests of county residents uh, at the March 19th public, uh, by the March 19th public comment deadline and by other uh, such appropriate measures and to report back to us by June 18th about uh, other legal, legislative and or regulatory actions. And um, I think this issue is one that is generating uh, increasing concern as people begin to understand the implications of carrier of last resorts, uh, walkaways, if that is permitted to happen. Uh, in layperson's language, uh, the, um, well, actually plain old telephone service is also a term of art in the public utilities document, public utility commission's documents, but uh, that kind of plain old telephone service uh, is really crucial for folks and live, who live in areas where mobile phone and internet service uh, is either non-existent or spotty. Uh, I mean, uh, simply put, having a landline is really their only option. So appreciate the uh, interest in this issue in our county and at this board level and look forward to staff weighing in with our formal direction to do so. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez, then Arenas. Thank you. Um, I, I want to just say thank you uh, to Supervisor Simidian for bringing this forward. It really is a very, very important issue, and I think um, having, you know, dealing with um, severe weather and climate change, the idea of not having a redundant system is pretty terrifying, and I think it's particularly um, an issue relative to making sure that we're getting help to the places that need it. And just as a reminder, you know, our, our, fire, our firefighters were really constrained um, when they were assisting in the Northern California fires because Verizon, I think it was Verizon that, that um, limited the access to internet. So having backup um, and under and a more robust underpinning of infrastructure is really important. And I also just wanted to remind my colleagues that we've had to weigh in quite a lot um, to the, you know, to this issue, not, not because we wanted to, but because during COVID, we had a bunch of our community that didn't have access to basic um, internet services. So really, this gets to the heart of the issue that as a county, we have to play a leadership role in this because we have so many people who rely on critical services and basic telephone service is one of those services that we need to make sure that we keep in place until, frankly, technology really does mean that we don't need it anymore and we are not in that um, situation today. So I really wanna ask for the county's uh, administration to be as creative as possible to help us um, make the case of, in front of the CPUC uh, that, frankly, we need we need AT&T to continue to play this very important and critical role um, in our community. And, you know, by the way, they benefit a great deal from the customers in, in this state. And, you know, this would be the, frankly, the least they could do. Thank you, Supervisor Arena Stanley. Thank you. I also want to thank um, uh, Supervisor Simeon for this referral. We also have something in common. We have folks who are out in um, open space and, and up in the hillsides, um, and a lot of it is very remote. Um, I've had quite a bit of casework where um, my team has shared with me that folks have been having quite a bit of, of issues with AT&T when we call on their behalf. They say, it should be working, but it's not. And, um, and when you have an emergency, that's when you really know that you, um, you know, the, the systems are really going to fail you. Um, and hopefully, you know, knock on wood, there's nothing that happens in our uh, respective districts uh, to compromise health or well-being of our residents. Uh, and so we need to figure out some, 
something in between um, because I, I I really hope that that um, the CPUC uh, doesn't allow for AT and T um, to to stop being that carrier of, of last resort. Otherwise, um, I mean, our residents are already having very shoddy service, and to have no service is is um, is really going to put them in in a, in a, di a huge disadvantage. Um, added with that is the remote location of their homes. Um, so, so anyways, uh, I, I hope that we can we can further this this referral. I I got calls from my residents, um, supervisor Simidian, asking me to support this as well. And so, um, and like I said, we've we've had a number of casework. So thank you so much for for your advocacy and for putting this forward. Supervisor Lee, then back to Simidian. Hello, can, can you hear me? Oh, can you hear me now? Well, how often have we screamed those words on our cell phone and our voice on IP service, right? Yeah. Well, landline quality reliable service is something very much underappreciated for years, and now I value my landline more than ever. Instead of say just cancel it because I have my cell phone. Landline is crucial for emergency preparedness. Landline are self-powered, so even works when the power is there's a blackout or self-service being disconnected. So I think this is something that is crucially important. I really want to thank my colleague, Supervisor Sumidian, and Supervisor um, Chavez for leading this effort to make sure that this is something that all our residents will be protected, especially those in more rural areas. Thank you very much. Thank you. Back to Supervisor Sumidian, and then I'll look for public comment. Do we have public speakers on this item? I have one hand raised in Zoom. No speakers in chambers. Doing a quick look around. I see nobody scurrying to get a yellow card. Let's hear our single speaker on Zoom, please. Brandon Baracco, please unmute. Hi, good morning, uh, Madam President and Supervisors. Uh, my name is Brandon Barranco, and I'm here on behalf of AT&T. Um, I would really like to thank Supervisor Samidia and Chavez for bringing this item to the board, because I think it gives us an opportunity for county staff to engage with the CPUC and uh, AT&T to dispel some of those myths I just heard regarding copper lines working with their, if there's no power and regarding that we are eliminating our line service. We're not doing that. We're not eliminating our, our phone line service. All we're doing is changing the technology behind it from a more to a more modern and reliable network. In fact, the copper net, just to be very blunt about it, the copper network is going to fail. It's going to fail. The parts that we need to maintain it are no longer being produced. And at its heart, the AT&T network modernization is ensuring that California has a plan to transition the customers before this failure happens. Out of our 21 state footprint, California is the only state that doesn't have Kohler relief or a plan to uh, migrate uh, customers to a more reliable network. Our goal is that the residents of Santa Clara County and everyone in the state has the most reliable, most resilient, and modern network that they rightfully deserve. So um, I would like to thank the supervisor for bringing this item. And uh, I want to emphasize that AT&T stands ready to address concerns, questions, and uh, engage with your residents. Thank you. Looking for any further comments? If not, we will take a vote. All right. Uh, go ahead, Anshane. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Item 11 is a uh, referral as well, and this is uh, being presented by Supervisor Lee. Thank you very much, President Ellenberg. Um, yes, so um, item 11 is an item relating to the exploring sites for safe parking and temporary housing. Uh, as we all know, this is something that's very much needed in our county uh, with our unhoused problems that we have been um, facing for so many, many years. Um, in this case, I actually have been approached by uh, Mayor uh, Mahan on multiple occasions for about uh, three, four months ago since uh, in these discussions. And it brought to my attention that the city council in San, in San Jose is currently undergoing some efforts to look into more temporary housing projects, including 
having safe parking programs. For example, the city of San Jose uh, has, the council has actually moved to push forward with the 1300 Berryessa supportive parking project with the aims to provide 131 parking spaces uh, back in June 2023. Uh, given the, the county's history and experience of supporting safe parking projects through Supervisor Civilian's leadership, I thought that getting the county involved is something that would be a, a good idea. The demand of providing safe harbor for RVs and other cars across the San Jose and Santa Clara County is clearly very much needed. And we have seen so many of these are now being parked in our neighborhoods and uh, certainly bringing all kinds of other associate issues. So I'm bringing this forward today in the interest of working interjurisdictionally with our city partners to address a housing crisis. The referral in front of you today has a couple of directions I'm asking uh, to look into. The first is to engage with the city of San Jose for some type of uh, um, uh, related uh, program, whether it's to do with uh, providing services uh, or some type of uh, what the cost would be uh, for this 1300 Berryessa Road Supportive Parking Project and to come back to the board um, at the May 7th, 2024 uh, Board of Supervisors meeting. And the second action is similar to what I asked back in 2021, which is asking the county to look into any of our unused county-owned parcels that may be suitable for temporary housing or safe parking sites, or exploring to look into any other public agency-owned parcels as well and engage with those agencies accordingly to look for potential new sites. And I hope I can get my colleagues uh, support on this time today, and I look forward to uh, 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 a good partnership uh, with the city of San Jose moving forward and any of our other cities as well when it comes to resolving our unhoused problems in our county that really needs uh, our uh, joint uh, work working together. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. I'd um, like to offer a, um, a second with some uh, additional, oh, I was going to do this? the same thing. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, do you mind if I yeah, no, go ahead? Please. Okay. Um, thank, I'm so sorry. I didn't see the light on. No, that's right. Um, would like to offer some some additional direction uh, for the for the report back. I, I appreciate your dedication and your energy in trying to get people housed and connected to services. And, and certainly, there's no doubt that we need to do more to ensure that the experience of homelessness is rare, rare, brief, and non-recurring uh, in our county. We, we all, all of us, see people living unsheltered or in cars or vans, uh, and I would say there's broad agreement that this is neither a safe nor sanitary way to live. We've also learned over the last nearly 10 years what types of investments are sustainable, which models build financial equity and provide a return on investment, and which models are most likely to lead to permanent housing. Uh, so here, here are some questions that I would need to have answered uh, in any any report back. So um, when when I finish making them, let me know if if that works for you, um, and then I uh, can can be a strong second. Uh, first, I want staff to confirm whether uh, this project would be aligned with the community plan to end homelessness. I know that our plan calls for some temporary solutions. Um, but I'm not sure where safe parking um, fits there specifically. Second, I want the report back to include information on our current safe parking partnerships, noting what services and amenities we pay for, the cost of those contracts, the land that's being used, and the success rate of moving families or individuals to stable housing. I want the fiscal information in the response to mirror that of um, an Office of Supportive Housing report to the board on the safe parking program in Mountain View from uh, June 2023. That information and table with the funding breakdown was really helpful in understanding the fiscal ramifications. I know that site safe parking and non-congregate shelter sites sound appealing, in part because the upfront costs are often far lower than the cost of housing. What often gets hidden or realized later is the extraordinary and ongoing expense of operating those sites, the limited funding streams that can be applied to those expenses, and the relatively small or comparatively small number of people who transition into permanent housing rather than back into unsheltered homelessness. 
we need to be investing for the long haul, and I think we need to be careful in our zeal to alleviate immediate crises that we find ourselves with no ongoing funding uh, sus to sustain any progress that we make. Um, aside from just straight up costs of funding interim sites in, in any given fiscal year generally, I want the report back to consider particularly the impact on our current budget. So when staff brings forward information on funding options, please specify how any of those identified funding sources uh, could further impact county plans for operations over the next few years that we already have um, in the pipeline. I know that department heads across our organization are currently being uh, directed to consider budget reductions, which may include position reductions, and we know raising fees for residents, so I just need to understand whether this funding request to help the city of San Jose uh, pay for the operation of their project, um, and specifically operation as opposed to um, covering some services, what that would mean uh, in terms of potential further position cuts or fee increases to the work that we're committed to doing. Um, again, I'll be very interested in seeing options, uh, and I just want to clearly acknowledge that one possible option may be a recommendation that there are more impactful ways our dollars should be deployed to address the very real crisis uh, before us. Are you comfortable with those additional questions? Yeah, I think I'm fine with it. And I just, actually I'm looking at staff because they are the ones going to come up back with a report with all these other things on there. Mm -hmm. But I think they are all very uh, helpful to understand the bigger picture. Is this something James, you would be able to do? Yes, we'll, we'll bring you know, the requested information forward as part of the report back. Thank you so much. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez, then Arenas. Yeah, thank you. I I am um, I concur with those um, re requests. I have one more broad request, and that is that. Uh, well, I thought your point about um, whether or not this aligns with our plan, uh, our our plan to end homelessness, is actually really an important point, and I think partly because. Um, we need to make sure that not just us, but all of our cities are really aligning to the plan. And I think um, all of us agree that the, one of the core issues that we have to deal with is the issue relative both to sustainability and um, whether or not we're, we're investing in the right parts of the system. And frankly, um, what parts of the system should the um, cities, not just San Jose, by the way, but all the cities be playing relative to the county? And, you know, um, I, th I think we all have had these frustrating conversations where both the public and the city say, why aren't you dealing with the homelessness problem instead of recognizing it's a more, uh, you know, that we really do understand that it's, it's something that we need to d address in a collaborative fashion. And I, at the risk of, of saying this out loud too many times, will just say to my colleagues, as, especially as we have newer colleagues and we will have uh, you know, two new members of the board very shortly, is that when we as a county decided to play a leadership role in housing, our staff said at that time, if you do this, everybody's gonna start to blame you for the housing problem. And they were 100% right that no, no good deed goes unpunished, right? And so I, I say all that because I do think that any investments that we make with any of our partners allow us an opportunity to do two things very rigorously. One is look at the plan and see if we're funding to the plan in a strategic way and whether or not we're doing it in a sustainable way. But the other is to, to look and to make sure that we're we're level setting with our partners in terms of what's the appropriate level of investment. And let me just go back to the plan process for a moment. One challenge we have is that if we are being asked to make investments, and it's not just, again, not just the city of San Jose, but Mountain View, any other city, in services and programs that are not our highest priority, but are gonna pull us into investing in, air, in ways that may or may not be, get us to that bottom line, that's actually a big concern. That all said, one higher goal that I have relative to all of this is how we make investments um, relative to the outcomes that we want and not, not doing it in a way that, that doesn't allow us to meet our goals. And I, I in particular want to talk about the, the roles that we're trying to do relative to housing families. So. 
all that is a long way of saying I really like the feedback um, that you've given, Susan. Otto, I think your your drive for us to respond to the immediate need is really critical, and I, I want to honor that by voting yes. And then I have just one addition that I'd like to make to um, the request that um, Supervisor Ellenberg is raising. At some point, I think it would be important for the board to get an update, not waiting, annual, not even annually, but to the community plan to end homelessness, and maybe this is in the fall, where we are looking and comparing the budget and investments that the county is making with all of the cities mm. that are our partners. Yeah. And if we could do that here in on one spreadsheet, because I think it would deal with the whose job is it, mm -hmm. um, and we could invite the cities to come and be part of a more robust discussion on on two issues: what what the plan is that we're investing in, right. and then what are all the investments we're making? Because I think some cities are just like really, and I think San Jose is one of them really doing their best um, to move forward. Mountain View's doing a lot. There are other cities that feel like they're doing a lot that aren't, and frankly, I think we ought to have that discussion. And then the other reason I think that discussion's really important is we all plan for our budgets. I know our staff, like we come in at the end, which we'll talk about in a minute in the May time frame, mm -hmm. but, our, but our staffs are planning budgets in November. So if we can do this, um, take this action in the fall, it would allow us also to reinforce for all of our colleagues if we're you know, if we're all using one system as we're supposed to right. be, and you know, and we're all, you know, we're prioritizing housing strategies. So, if we could add that a coordinated uh, presentation in the fall that is preparatory for the following budget year, I think then I would feel very excited about uh, supporting this. And Supervisor Lee, I, I know you're the maker of a motion. Are you comfortable with that process? No, absolutely. I think we uh, we really need to leave no stones unturned in terms of trying to figure out how we can solve this problem. And certainly, we need to also look at the bottom line, what we can and cannot afford to do. Uh, at the end of the day, this is, <laughs> and we, we talk to anybody, uh, this is our number one issue uh, of our community that's concerned. And, and it's, it's really, <sighs> the bottom line is when you see people being unsheltered living in these homeless sites, uh, it, it's just inhumane. And, and whether they're in the RVs or the cars. Uh, and so by able to having, like, for example, the safe parking site, the specific thing that we're talking about, it really provides a lot of the services getting connected. It's really like the entry point to it. Um, we've heard, I mean, I've heard stories talking to uh, many of the housing advocates that uh, folks actually are not as eager to go into permanent or the housing or other type of housing because then they will leave the RV alone and then somebody might break into it and they lose that as their most prized possession. So there's, these issues are extremely complicated. Uh, how to get the RVs working, you know, getting it fixed, that's another issue. So we've been dealing with these issues, I guess, for the last few years having, I mean, I, I, I do visit these uh, sites, I would say approximately, at least on a monthly basis and talk to the folks uh, one by one. Uh, and so I really do think that there's not one homeless problem. We have like 16 of these different issues, but sometimes we conflate it all into, oh, these are homeless people. It's so much more complex. We get it, we, we deal with them in, in so many areas. Uh, of course, the areas that only we are generally uh, more, have the expertise and the funding to do, like on the health side, on the mental health side, and the drug detox side, there's, but that's a really a small part of it, mm -hmm. right? Because when we went to the, um, the State of the Valley uh, that came out about uh, about two weeks ago uh, uh, talked about the cost of homelessness. One of the research that came out, which I thought was you know, fascinating, is number one reason, uh, highest number, I think 25 pe people, percent of people who become homeless was simply losing their jobs, people living paycheck to paycheck. Uh, and so just providing something for them quickly for rapid rehousing so that they could get back and not losing the housing they have then, maybe tie them over while they're looking for the next job, uh, you know, is so much more important on the prevention side. So that's absolutely key. Uh, the, the second item that was identified in the Valley Report was about um, uh, mental health and drug-related issues. And the third one that was identified was actually family divorces and those type of issues that cause people to homeless. So I think we really need to understand the, the issues and not like sometimes I think the many times folks who 
conflate all those issues into one thing uh, about crime and drugs and all that. It's, it's not that simple. And I think all what we're doing here is really trying to figure out the different type of solutions necessary to try to help this huge uh, problem. And, and getting people from one place to another, it's a sequence of process. We have this thing called the continuum of care right now in our county for that very reason, because people need certain services. And along the way, and of course, all the goal we have is to try to get people with permanent housing whether it's our support of housing, or reuniting the families, or you know, get back on their feet working and whatnot. All these are, are great things that this county, I just want to say I'm so honored to be on this board with all of you because every one of you truly cares and understand about this issue. Um, but one thing I do find surprising, having been here for three months, uh, three years now on this board, is the amount of working together with our other partners in the cities, whether it's the San Jose and sometimes Sunnyvale, any other cities, 15 towns and cities, have been frankly less than expected. I think the public thought we worked together much more, but I don't think we are. And I really don't think this is something that this is your issue or this is my issue. I think this is our issue, and I think we really need to come up with that spirit, hopefully moving forward, uh, to find solutions together. Uh, and and it's um, it, it's disappointing to to sometimes I, I know, you know we are elected officials we are from different cities uh, and and sometimes people feel like uh, this is us this is them I think it's all of us and we really need to and then one of the issues I keep hearing from like from Sunnyvale folks and even some of the San Jose folks is like gee I really want to put some of the the unhoused right here in Sunnyvale. But, oh, no, you can't do that because you have to go through other system and you're just starting to sending folks to Gilroy. That, that would make not, or even South San Jose, really that makes no sense because this is where they are, this is where they want to be. And so if, if we're given a choice, some of them say, no, I'm not going to shelter. I'd rather stay, uh, stay where I'm at in Sunnyvale or, or North County. So I think it's so important to, to make sure that we are working together. Uh, and I've talked to so many. And, and frankly, I, I mean, we, this is an issue that we've been working Ev at least every week, if not every day, since I've been on here the last three years, uh, talking to advocates, actually going out there. Uh, and, and I appreciate the need of really, like, and, and this board has been great, about $950 million of measuring money, building this housing, buying land. That is really uh, amazing, aggressive. Uh, but at the same time, I think we also need to make sure we are meeting the 16 different type of needs out there. Uh, and try to get people into the system, getting the services, and given, and then hopefully through that that process, we could really get, you know, there's the, the term sheltered and unsheltered. We haven't talked too much about it here, but I mean, I, I think getting people sheltered uh, itself itself is a huge important goal, and and this is one of those efforts that we're trying to get more folks from unsheltered to sheltered. Thank you. Thanks, and just um, as, as the seconder of the motion, um, Supervisor Chavez um, loved the idea of the joint meeting. Um, it, what I would like to do, just in my capacity as the board president, is is uh, carve out a workshop time during an already scheduled board meeting. I'd like to invite one representative, one council member or mayor from each of the cities um, to participate so that we don't have Brown Act issues and have to notice oh, everybody's meetings. I, I think that meetings. makes sense. And I, what I would just say, I think this would, and, and I, and all Susan, and colleagues, I'll I'll send a, a a letter around with just a recommendation about how to do it. I think Joe and I have had to do a couple of these hearings as part of the Blue Ribbon Task Force and other well, things. So yeah, we'll we'll send a, a guidepost. But I think you're right that not only do we not want to vi violate the Brown Act, but I also think it's, you know, um, in the fall we could pot potentially be looking at a regional housing bond. So I think these discussions are also really helpful in terms of helping people understand the, the opportunities with that that maybe we're not all thinking about yet. Great, I'm Thanks. gonna go to Supervisor Arenas, then Samidia. Thank you. Um, I'm also very supportive of uh, every effort um, for affordable and um, um, immediate shelter, uh, but mostly uh, permanent affordable housing is where I'm, I like to be focused and I know that's part of our, our plan to end homelessness is really focused on that and, and it was quite disturbing when I um, 
when I left the council that um, the measure that we had approved for um, permanent housing and to, to contribute to permanent housing inventory was um, getting sidetracked for more of these immediate efforts um, because that's not what we had shared with our voters. That's not the commitment that we had um, said to them. And so um, it, with that, I, I have seen our city of San Jose um, shift in their values and I think has a lot to do with leadership in, in terms of what they believe is the most effective or efficient way to address homelessness. Um, so I love this idea of this um, hearing that will bring all of all of the reps in and actually have one discussion. Each city does review the um, plan to end homelessness in its own, you know, respective municipalities, but we never had that. Um, discussion, you know, that, that, that very rich discussion among all of us so that we understand and have the same <laughs> maybe definition of, of what permanent affordable housing means to all of us um, and, and what shelter actually, right, means for all of us because there's, there's also in, inadequate housing and I, you know, I have a big beef with how we um, identify adequate housing um, versus like McKinney Vento uh, sees children who are um, overcrowded in a home, um, living you know two to three, four families in one home as inadequate housing. And we don't, we see that as adequate. And, and to me that is, is uh, creating more risk for our children to be abused, especially um, sexually. Um, mm. And so we also need to shift the ways that we are viewing um, adequate and inadequate shelter and housing. And, and I think this, this, this conversation will be very beneficial. Um, what, one of the things that I'm concerned about, I'll, I'll, I'll be supportive of this, but um, with a lot of trepidation because I have, um, as a council member, I move forward safe parking. Um, it didn't say where, but I wanted it to be to to have uh, children and families addressed because I was very concerned what I was hearing. There was a lot of of our families out there in um, in cars and uh, not a, pl a safe place. Mm -hmm. um, and so the housing department um, they decided where it was going to get placed. I didn't dictate what that would look like, and they put it in um, in my colleague's district. Um, and uh, it was, it's a very low resourced area. And that created a lot of havoc because there was folks who were coming in, either they also brought in their RVs or brought, also brought in their cars and then they brought in, you know, folks that they connected with and, um, and just a lot more activity in an area that was already very um, impacted. And, um, it, you know, the, the, the the point of the safe parking was actually to improve, you know, the the safety and well-being of our children. We understood that that wasn't the best uh, strategy for children and families, right? Even though there was a, a resource center there and and a library, and you know, we had connected everybody, and it just um, we ended up switching that that strategy to a hotel voucher simply because it, it made more sense for our children and for our families. It is not very, uh, su you know, a long sustaining strategy, but certainly I think it's, it's more um, appropriate than a safe parking. Although I know that a lot of our churches and a lot of our nonprofits still continue to do safe parking and include um, children. Now, I learned, we learned as, as a council that we needed to resource an area ahead of time if we knew that they, we were going to do safe parking. Mm. To mitigate some of that impact that was gonna get created either by additional blight or additional just, you know, foot traffic or just the impact to that uh, particular neighborhood. And so that's one of the efforts that was, was then created to alleviate some of the safe parking locations which means it's more expensive, right, to, to, to do a safe parking. Um, and then the, the, uh, on the other end of this, we said, well, 
maybe we'll do it in a, an area that's well resourced. And and in the north part of uh, San Jose, there was an RV slash you know kind of car um, safe parking. And that neighborhood was up in arms from the first day. It was very well resourced neighborhood. Mm. And they called every single uh, meeting. They called our subcommittees. Um, they put a lot of political pressure. They put a lot of pressure. I'm saying I think it was political pressure um, on that particular council member who then ended up retracting that site. And so what I'm afraid of is that this is going to happen again because it, it's in the same council members district. And I've already seen it. So I don't know that they're going to have the political will to stay strong and to see this through. And then the county is going to provide resources and invest. So I, I'm just being as precautious as I can be, I, I want to support this, but I also want us to learn from lesson, from past lessons, right, and what this actually means when it comes to a neighborhood and what it means to those particular council members that are going to represent that area and what it means to us. I think there's a nice balance in which we bring some of the resources that make sense to the area. Uh, and to the to 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 the issue, um, I think there's uh, behavioral health and and maybe and I know not every person that is in their car RV need that support, but there certainly is some areas where um, how can it not impact your mental and well-being when you're living in your car? And you used to live in an apartment or in home or in whatever it is. You were married and now you're divorced. Whatever the situation is. And as human beings, we, we try to feel better. And sometimes we look for substances to, to help self-medicate. And so I also think that there's um, our behavioral health, our substance abuse um, support programs that could very well make sense to, to the areas. I'm just concerned about what is it that we are going to contribute. We're going to contribute funding, um, or are we going to contribute resources? And I'd love for us to contribute resources that, uh, in terms of what we do well. What we do well is behavioral health. We do, you know, we have substance abuse programs. We have other interventions that, that. Um, Foes who are unhoused or in cars or living in their RVs can can benefit from, and I think that we need to make sure that when this comes back, that we are not just putting money on the table, but that we are um, putting money on the table in the resources that make sense for us. And then, of course, make sure that you have those very clear conversations with folks at the city, because um, this would be our first joint effort and I would hate for this to have any level of retraction um, based on the, on the area. So anyways, that's, that's my feedback. Thank you. Hi. Yes, go ahead, uh, Supervisor Suminian. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Lee. Uh, I'll be an I vote. Uh, I did, however, want to just um, make sure that as you go through this process, uh, one of the areas that uh, folks take a look at, make sure we're current on, is the status of uh, state legislation, state law, on um, potential legal obligations of folks who provide or sponsor safe parking. One of the reasons that, and it was a, a significant driver actually, one of the reasons that my office and I got as involved as we did, I wanna say, four or five years ago now uh, in North County safe parking is that local jurisdictions, cities, were understandably anxious about the status of state law at the time, mm -hmm. uh, 
and I'm underscoring at the time, with respect to potential landlord-tenant obligations that might attach to them if they provided safe parking uh, in uh, their communities. And legislation at the time had a specific carve out from some of those potential uh, obligations for a handful of identified cities and counties, if I remember correctly. And I don't know how much, uh, and I don't want to put them on the spot today, certainly, because it's not necessary to address this today. But I worked uh, extensively with the county council's office, and I see we have four people at the dais who were in the county council's office at that time. Uh, and um, my understanding is that the legislature, and so it, it, because there was a carve out that included Santa Clara County specifically, if I remember correctly, um, it, it provided some degree of reassurance that if we were the, the, um, the, the host, if you will, for such sites in cooperation and collaboration with the local community. Uh, now, my understanding is that that legislation has changed. I don't know if, if folks want to weigh in on this today or not. As I say, I don't think it's necessary to weigh in on it today, uh, but I do think it'll be helpful and important to make sure that whatever the state of the law is today is clearly understood and to the point colleagues have been making clearly communicated to the local jurisdictions so that if it's an impediment, you can get it resolved, and if it's not, people know that it's not. Uh, and as I say, that's that that's a an, an artifact of recent history. Um, I don't, as I say, I don't know where things stand today. So I just want to make sure that county council's office and uh, county staff are mindful of those issues and make sure they get addressed in their report back to you. Thank you. We're certainly happy to look at that supervisor submittee and and uh, we'll uh, review the legislation and its current status. Just one last point I wanted to make, and this is more for my colleagues and a little bit for staff, but one other thing I think, the other reason I was so interested in us having a conversation with our colleagues is that I, I do get nervous, and I'm so glad you raised the issue about the design problem, uh, Supervisor Adanas, because I, th that makes so much sense in terms of the thinking that went through that. I, I think that we have such excellent staff here that I, I think we should be thinking about a benchmark for investing, if we're going to, in programs and projects that the county staff actually help design. Because I think Supervisor Simidian's point and Supervisor Ananas's point is a really good one, which again is, I meant to say it earlier, but I feel a little like we're being pulled into something that hasn't been robustly uh, uh, thought through. Uh, and I'm not speaking just of this uh, um, supervisor lead because I think your point is right that we have to jump in there. But I'll just use the example of the Cerrone Yard debate that we had at, at BTA. And one of the big challenges we had is that the city of San Jose wanted to put an excess of 200 units in one location. And frankly, we had not seen in our own county any experience above that 200 number. And there's some debate about how big a facility can be before you can't properly manage it. And that, that was very challenging to deal with the city on because the city had an objective, which I understood. BTA had an objective both in terms of the utilization of their land and, and you know, other, other challenges. But the city was unencumbered with the idea that there may be too many people in one location. And that, that's, that's a challenge. Um, so anyway, so I, I also would just say that if our staff, as you're considering um, roles for the county, um, that we really wanna make sure our, our staff is saying, yes, we helped think that through because now we know it's sustainable or we've learned from these other experiences that, that have been raised. So thank you for letting me weigh in again. Thank you, can we go to public comment? Yes, go ahead. Right. I'll, I'll comment All right, later. do we have speakers in chambers or on Zoom? We have one speaker in chambers and two on Zoom. All right. Y'all know the drill. If you don't have a yellow card in, I'll assume you're not intending to speak on this item. Let's hear our, you said one, one here and two on Zoom. Mm -hmm. We'll hear those three speakers, please. Two minutes each. Sharon Luna is our speaker in chambers. Please approach the podium. Well, it's almost afternoon. 
thank you for allowing me to speak. I just want to say thank you, Supervisor Lee, for this parking initiative. But what I would like to recommend and what I've seen during my dealings with the county, the different departments, is follow-up. You have to have follow-up to make something work. Mm -hmm. And with the spreadsheet that was recommended, you could add to that as far as follow-up. Because it's important. When you put something in, and we've seen a lot of it, you see these housing elements, you see these parking spots. I have a friend that's in one right now. They're not being followed up. How is it going? What are you doing? Does it work? You have to, and again, I repeat, because I'm a big follow-upper, mm -hmm. and it's important to me to end what has started. You have to have a closing. I thank you. And on Zoom, we have uh, Paul Soto. Please accept the MU. Uh, thank you, Paul Soto. Um, I want to thank uh, Supervisor Lee for your comments, um, your intentionality in this issue, and your your ability to pick up the nuances of the conversation. I really take exception with what Supervisor uh, Ellenberg was stating, uh, simply because it looks like there is a seeking out of a way to get out of it and saying that you want to know whether or not this complies with the how who cares whether it does or not so what you're saying is that if it doesn't oh well we're gonna that gives us the excuse to scratch it out we're talking about an existential crisis here which means the very existence of human beings is at stake so i'm sorry and i apologize to you if it doesn't fit into a box that was made at some other later date which is the reason why I want to thank Supervisor Lee for his comments regarding modification. We have to be that flexible with this because we're talking about human life. Secondly, is that we're also talking about ambulance rides. When you don't invest in people's stability, that contributes to far more hospital visits. I know I was one of them. I went to the hospital via uh, ambulance three times within six weeks because my health was deteriorating on the streets. I had high blood pressure. My high, my high blood pressure now, just with a proper diet, I don't need medication. I do not need medication. This is a fact that I do not need it as long as the ability is maintained and I'm able to eat properly. So this is the kind of impact that investing in these kinds of safe parking spaces can have because it provides the stability, which means less hospital visits. So pay here or pay there, but you're going to pay. Why not do it? Emily is next. Please accept the unmute. You may begin your comments. Hello, supervisors. My name is Emily Mungia, and I work on Mayor Mahan's team. I'm calling in to share our support for Supervisors Lee's recommendations for the county to explore operational cost sharing agreements with the City of San Jose for the Berryessa supportive parking site and dedicate currently unused county-owned parcels for safe parking and other temporary housing solutions. We thank Supervisor Lee for his leadership in pursuing opportunities for the city and county to partner on solutions to homelessness. As both a resident and employee of San Jose, I have witnessed firsthand the stark reality faced by many of our unhoused residents who don't have a safe place to sleep at night. I have visited several RV encampments and met with the residents living there and seen the harsh conditions they live in from having to pool resources because they only have a few generators to share amongst a couple dozen residents to having to wait for waste removal services because it only comes about once a week, if at all. With over 800 lived-in RVs on San Jose streets, we desperately need more safe, supportive parking sites to move people out of these unmanaged, unsafe conditions and connect them to the high quality services that will put them on the path to permanent housing. We welcome the opportunity to partner with the county to align on our collective resources and expertise to provide high quality services at the Berryessa supportive parking site. Thanks to Supervisor Smidian's leadership, the county did establish this similar agreement with the City of Mountain View to provide services across multiple safe parking sites. We hope you will move to do the same for San Jose. 
And not only would the county support help moving people off our streets, but it would also provide environmental benefits. San Jose has been directed to remediate conditions in which trash and debris are released in our storm drains and eventually to our waterways and creeks often by these lift-in vehicles. So this would require a lot of planning and resources, and we need the county support for accomplishing these ambitious goals, beginning with this cost sharing of safe parking sites and providing land to stand up other interim solutions to our most vulnerable population. I urge you to support. That was our last speaker. Thank you very much. We have a motion and a second. Are we ready to vote, colleagues? Um, some final comments, please. Uh, thank you so much for my colleagues' uh, comments. So, uh, specifically uh, with uh, so uh, uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Supervisor Arenas, thank you so much for your uh, uh, understanding and uh, illustrating that story of in San Jose District Four that went through that whole uh, uh, very divisive, you know, discussion and all that. And I think a lot of it too. NIMBYism is part of a problem, but at the same time, who wants a neighborhood that lives in that don't feel safe, that the kids cannot go to their playground and whatnot? So I completely agree with that. And I, I really do believe it's l sometimes less about what's being built, but actually how it's being operated, or as Sarah Nuna mentioned, how it's being followed up. What I mean by that is, uh, like Hillview Court, right? In Milpitas, we spent, you know, we got the, the home key project, paid for the, the project. It was one of those perms of housing. We're very happy to have been built. Since it's finished, and that's when I just first come to office, we've been practically meeting almost weekly on that project because of the number of operational challenges it has faced, number of calls of service to fire department, the police. So the fact that is the perm support of housing the way we've been looking at this is holy grail. It's not it. It's not just what we built, but how it's being run, right? At the end of the day, that's what the bottom line is. And so I don't want to just throw the, the, the baby with bad water. So it's not so, so much as the, the parking program itself being a bad thing. I think it's a matter of how it's being operated. That's what we need to focus on. We obviously need neighborhood you know, inputs of how to make it work better, because that's the neighborhood they live in. Uh, but at the same time, I think the, the, the part that we need to work better, that is why I came up with the referrals, I felt that the counties and the cities really haven't been working together. And I really think that to solve these issues, these operational challenges, we need to be much closer, tighter on our uh, our connections, uh, because we provide certain services that the cities can't, obviously, right? We're providing the, the mental health and, and health and the, the, the drug type of relation issues. But there's so much more in the wraparound services that we need to work together. So I'm hoping that this would help uh, pulling these parties together. Uh, and uh, eventually, the idea is that the operational challenges that we have learned from these other sites, whether it's Hillview Court or the parking site you mentioned before, through those learning lessons, let's learn from that so that the future is that these sites that we built, whether it's temporary or interim or permanent housing, would address these issues ahead of time so that we don't get those calls afterwards uh, of how we could fix them. So th that's, that's the spirit of all this. And I really want to thank all my colleagues for listening out. This is a tough one. I mean, out of all the stuff that we do, this is a tough one. And would that be, you know, when the political will will get hit, I guess I'm, I'm fortunate to, to make it through the ballot for another four more years. And the, your colleague, you mentioned uh, uh, District 4 council member, I guess he made it too for another four years. And sometimes because these projects really takes not just one or two years, it might take a while. Once you establish it, it takes time to work out the kinks, to work it out. So that way, hopefully with time, we could prove that these are actually workable solutions, getting people actually sheltered, and finally through this path to permanent housing. That's Great. absolutely our goal. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. A final comment? Sounds like we've got broad agreement and lots of work to do offline afterward. Go yes, right ahead. I, I just wanted to um, see if you could include this in the a actual motion, and that is to consider the kind of resources, just iter reiterating what you just finished saying, um, Supervisor, is that uh, can, I don't know if it's, it's an, an amount that they're looking for or in terms of in-kind services, and I think that we need to consider what we do best, and what we do best is those support services, mm -hmm. which is something that actually I've asked our housing department in, in um, previously because I've wanted to have some of our um, HOPE sites and um, some of our sites where the city of San Jose has um, supported 
um, the unhoused community near creeks or just it, it, there's different areas. Um, and for the county to bring in some of their resources to help stabilize the folks who are actually there, I think that we need to continue to have these conversations about what is it that we bring to the table? Mm -hmm. And what we bring to the table are support services, and I hope that they can see that versus just a dollar amount. Yeah. Anyways, so I'm hoping that you can fold you, that you're in. You're taking words out of my mouth. Thank oh, you very much. Perfect. I'm completely in agreement. Thank you. Thank you. Let's vote on this item, please. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Simidian, aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. The motion passes. Thank you very much. It is 12.09. Um, why don't we hear the county executive and county council report, and then we will break for 30 minutes and come back and hear 14, 16, and 34. And what? 46. 14, 14 46, 46, 46, 16, 34. 16, 34. Thank you very much. Madam President, before staff vacates the president uh, premises, um, is there any chance we could hear the Williamson Act item before we took the break? Well, it, it's two items together that would hold them. Um, if not, not. I, I just they're anticipated. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. Back, I think right. they're anticipated to be relatively short. Do we want to do that? Well. All right, then let's do out of order, 14 and 46, then break, and we will hold county executive and county council until afterward. Right. Okay, is that good for everyone? All right, so 14 um, and then 46 in sequence. Thank you for being flexible. Glad to not eat up your entire day. Go ahead, let's start with introductions, please. Thank you, President Elmberg. Lisa McKyle, uh, Deputy Director with the Department of Planning and Development. Uh, we're excited to deliver today a presentation uh, that stems from our agricultural plan that was adopted by the Board of Supervisors. Uh, we've introduced uh, a new program here to allow access for uh, agri agricultural programs um, across the county uh, with tax incentives as well as streamline some processes. Uh, with us today we have senior planner Joanna Wilk who will give a presentation as well as Michael Meehan, principal planner, and county council Lizanne Reynolds. I'll Great, and let me just Joanna. confirm that I agreed to this switch because I heard our county council say that, the, that this will be a brief item, so I just want to confirm that it is in fact realistic without rushing you to hear uh, both 14 and 46 within about 20, 25 minutes. I think you, you all yes. can just go to questions. Is go right to questions? I would just go to questions. Why don't we do that then? Um, I'll start with Supervisor Sumidian. Thank you, uh, Madam President and uh, staff. Um, we have a robust packet of background information in our uh, materials. And um, I'm looking at item number 14 at packet page 41. There is recommended action there, and I am prepared to move approval of the recommended action if that is appropriate at this time. Second. Great. Do we have any public speakers? Yes, we do. We have one in chambers, and let me see. One hand raised in Zoom. All right, reminder, both in chambers and on Zoom, if you're intending to speak on this item, now is the time to either submit your yellow card or raise your virtual hand. We'll close the queue when the first speaker begins speaking. Are we holding at uh, two on Zoom? One on Zoom and one in chambers, yep. Okay, let's go ahead, two minutes please. Julie Morris. My name is Julie Morris. I am your county's agriculture liaison. I work with your staff, farmers, ranchers, and the University of Cooperative Extension to advance your agricultural plan. And I'm here today to urge support of this item. It shows your action in promoting the visionary agricultural plan that Santa Clara County has approved in preserving prime farmland, 
supporting local farms and ranchers, increasing our food security, and uh, preserving our rich agricultural heritage, as well as promoting climate change resilience. So I urge this approval, and I thank you for your leadership on this important item. Our speaker in Zoom, Paul Soto, please accept the MU. Uh, yes, Paul Soto. We have very different uh, experiences with the preservation of farm. You have to remember that the farm workers movement started here in this county, here in this county, because of racist policies and racist ranchers and racist uh, whatever you want to, what, what, racist farmers because of the exploitation of the, Mexica, of the Mexican body in our communities. Now, you have on this record, it states that you want, that they, they already have Prop 13 protections, which means the assessed value of those properties are not consistent with their actual value. So they're already getting tax breaks with the Prop 13. This is an absolutely no. That's why the, that's why the county executive wanted to shut this down and why he wanted to go straight to questions because he knows what's in here. And he did not want anybody, he did not want what was in this contract to be stated publicly on the record. This is an absolutely not, this is disgusting because of the Prop 13 protections that it already has, which means that property can be valued at $5 million, but because of Prop 13, it's blocking them already from paying that much. And now they want more? No, at this time when we are being fiscally responsible, we need every single dollar, every single tax dollar that we could possibly get from these ranchers and these farmers. And you know what that is? That is justice. That is justice. They owe their fair share because of what it is that my community had to experience in all these farms. These farms got a history, a history of exploitation of the Mexicano. And that is the reason that we have the farm workers movement. That is the reason why we have the Chicano movement. That is the reason why we have the lowrider movement. That is the reason why that this was the second CSO that was ever created in the state of California because of Fred Ross. He came here because of that exploitation and John Steinbeck wrote vociferously about it. Absolutely not. Cancel this. That was our last speaker. Thank you. I'm going to go right down the row, Supervisor Arenas. Thank you. I, I want to uh, thank our planning um, staff for their hard work um, on and updates to the Williamson Act program. I know there's a, a number of things that you've done to improve it, including the streamlining, which is the streamlining process, which I know is going to be very um, helpful to a lot of our farmers who throughout um, the time that I've just started, and it's only been one year, um, but I've had many calls come in about building the sheds, just building something extra that is going to take one a really long time and just creates a lot of havoc um, for our farmers. And so I really appreciate that. I, I think at some point they were at being asked to apply for a CUD for every change that they were making. And so it just doesn't make sense for them, especially that because we know now you you have to be a huge huge farmer in order to really make money off of um, what you whatever it is that you're producing whether it's flowers or um, vegetables or or fruit um, and so I want to thank you for that I know that there's um, an extension in terms of of uh, the the tax credit and um, anyways all of those elements thank you for for working on this um, I also want to. Um, recognize um, Paul Soto's comments about um, previous exploitation of of um, mi migrants and immigrants in in the farm worker I mean in the farming industry, and it's one of the reasons why I'm focused on farm worker housing and ensuring that um, we also streamline the building of um, housing that honors the folks who are actually doing the really hard work every day. Um, just last week, I went to see a film called um, The Unbroken Sky. Mm -hmm. And it was um, based on some of the books by uh, Dr. Francisco Jimenez. And it really, it just outlined, y you know, the this, this storyline of many families um, um, that worked on the farms and, and 
their their trials and tribulations in terms of integrating into the American society and being rejected and you know just uh, all of that difficulty, um, and it it um, allowed for for me to see it an additional American story, because that's an American story, right? It's the the initial the beginning of an uh, an American story. Um, which is made up of all kinds of, of immigrants. We are a country of immigrants, except for those who were native to this country. And so um, I, I, I do want to recognize that it has, we've had a lot of exploitation. We continue to have a lot of exploitation, and I'm not turning um, a blind eye to, to all of that. That is still very much um, something that, that um, pains me and, and that we, we hope to continue to recognize and work on, um, not only with the United Farm Worker um, unions, but, but with, directly with our community and listening to them and acknowledging what it is that they need. And um, part, of, part of our efforts um, in our farm worker housing is making a, a, creating a study and having um, an inquest to those farm workers in terms of what it is that they need. And uh, we've already assumed that a resource center out in our south part of our county is part of that solution. So anyway, so I wanted to, to make sure that I, in balance, um, respond to not only the needs of our farmers out there, but the needs of our farm workers and those who are employed by them. And, and so it's it's a comprehensive look, um, and it's not singular to, to just um, the farmers, but at this time, this is what we're, we're what we're responding to, and so I really want to thank all of you for the work that you're doing. Um, I know it's tedious and it's probably very long, um, but I I appreciate it, and I know um, uh, our folks who are preserving um, agricultural land will also thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Yes, thank you. Um, I I had a question and then just a comment. Uh, could you talk just a moment about the open space um, overlap. There, there was a, a comment here about overlap with open space easement contracts and how you're cleaning those up. And, and, and just, I, I was a little bit, um, so what I don't know is, does that mean open space authorities easements go away and this is all in one now or? Through the chair, I, I can respond to this Thank you. question. Um, <clears throat> so in, in brief, uh, None of the amendments be, as proposed have any impact on the county's open space easement program, which is the reference that you see mm -hmm. in those guidelines, um, nor on, on the open space authority. So the, the program as it currently exists remains intact. I, if anything, we, we, we kept it separate and we, we removed it from the document that has been revised so that it's clearer that we're not, um, we're not amending or modifying the open space easement program. So just again, so I understand this, the open, could you have an open space easement and a Williamson Act um, on the same property? So the, no, I don't believe that you could. The, the okay. open space easement isn't explicitly intended for a non-commercial agricultural property. It's similar commercial. to the Williamson Act. And again, this is different from the easements that, for example, Open Space Authority um, will hold. This is a county program that was largely used for, for agricultural properties that were no longer in commercial agricultural use. It's not something that we see too often in the county anymore, um, but we're leaving it largely untouched nonetheless. So, um, so just again, uh, I, and you're right, I'm, I'm, I'm conflating the, uh, some work we're doing with the Open Space Authority with this um, document or this proposed uh, changes. And so what you're saying is that the new documents that we have here will be more distinct so people will know if they can opt into one program or another. Is that accurate? That's accurate. Okay. Um, and then just one comment I wanted to make. Uh, you know, this is, a, I know this is not a small body of work. And I also know that there are a lot of other communities looking at what you all are doing to see if they can do this as well to protect um, more 
agricultural land and do that in a way that actually is supportive of the, the not just the property owners, but I think the point that my colleague raised just about the overall opportunities that this will help support and create, we hope, in South County is really important. I know you've been working on this a long time, and I really just wanted to say a very sincere thank you. I know this took a lot of conversations with a lot of people who were very concerned about the implications of, of this kind of action, and that you're working with a lot of agencies out in South County as well. So just a very sincere thank you. I'm really excited to vote for this today. Great, are we ready to, let's vote on this item, please. Go ahead. Oh, and I'm sorry, I'm motion in a second. Through the chair, I missed the second. I was, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, um, Supervisor Rennes. Yes. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Simidian, aye. Vice President Lee. Aye. And President Ellenberg. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you very much, and we'll go directly to questions as well on item 46. Thank you. And this was actually an item I, I wanted to just ask a very, um, two very broad questions. Um, and I'll, I'll state them as folks come down. One is, I, I know this is a report looking back at what we've accomplished, and my, my question is, based on what we have accomplished, are we, are we in any um, jeopardy in terms of whether or not we're meeting our targets and goals with the state based on this report? And to be frank with you, um, I, I read the report in its printout version, so it was very tiny. So I'm, I'm asking you this question in part because of that. Through the President, Lisa McKyle, Deputy Director, we are not in jeopardy. We communicated with uh, the Department of Housing uh, and Community Development, HCD, as well as our County Council. So this is the appropriate approach to report on the fifth cycle programs, as well as one of the tabs uh, in, the, in the state mandated uh, format has us reporting on the sixth cycle RENA numbers, and so we've done that. And then my, my second question is, um, it, as it relates to how we're gonna move forward with RENA in the future, are the reports gonna be the same like they are today, or are they, tr did they give you a whole nother form to, f you're all making faces, so, and I don't even have glasses on and I can tell, so, <laughs> so that's something. What, um, ha yeah, how will the reporting be the same or change in the future? Sure, we, we, I think we were all smiling. Uh, the, the state mandates the format. They do change it re somewhat regularly these days. They were more f um, consistent in the past, but I've observed them changing about every two years or so. So the reason I'm asking the question is, as it relates to the new um, rules that are coming down from the state, I'm just wondering if, how the reporting matrix makes us appear to them. And I will say, I, I think, I recognize there are so many changes, and I also recognize that I have not talked to the same person there twice at the state, and I mean, it's, it's actually unnerving, frankly, to have, to be evaluated w in an environment that's so inconsistent. So that's partly why I'm asking the question. Um, I, and just, just as a, a statement there, I'm, I'm just wondering if we're playing a leadership role in helping them determine what they should be assessing us on instead of having the, the framework simply come down from them? Like, is that an area that you all are able to engage in? Sure, through the, through the president. We do have uh, conversations with HCD uh, on a somewhat regular basis, especially as we're moving through the housing uh, element process. But as the Senate bills and assembly bills are moving forward, we're also having those conversations where we can. Um, that's probably the best I can answer. I don't, I don't know that there's another forum. We can also participate with ABAG, which works closely with HCD as well on legislative movement. I think that's actually gonna be pretty critical um, because I am concerned that even with all of us following the RENA framework that I, I'm not sure there's a clear standard statewide <laughs> Joe's laughing. Really, uh, in terms of how how it will be determined that we're actually doing what we're supposed to be doing, and I'm very nervous about that. And to be frank with you, I'm even concerned about ABAG being the regional, not, not because ABAG's doing anything wrong, but they're no better suited than we are to watch what's kind of happening at the state. Um, so I, I say that more because this may be something that goes into the David Campos um, bucket, um, but, I, but I do wanna just make sure that we're doing our best to demonstrate 
how we're doing in this in this arena, so to speak, in this in this new format, so that we're not um, dinged, for lack of a better word, even though we're trying to do everything that we're supposed to be doing. So I would just ask that you know, one, I'm really excited about this, but would just say to to our um, county executive that as we think about um, that very small and mighty team's body of work that really playing a leadership role in how we're gonna be assessed and judged in the future, I think we cannot, um, I can't, we can't overstate the importance of that relative to the chaos that I anticipate is coming our way um, with the new RENA approach. So, thank you. Great, good, thank you. Do we have, um, can I get first a, a motion and a second to receive the report? So moved. Second. Thank you, do we have public speakers on this item? I have one hand raised in Zoom. All right, no speakers in chambers. Let's hear our single speaker on Zoom. Paul Soto, please unmute. Uh, yes, Paul Soto. I'd like to talk about the redlining map of 1939. That has been accurately contextualized within the context of this conversation about the housing element. And the re reason why I say that is this, whenever you have a big starting point, of any, anything, of math, you know, of any kind of sequence of equations, if you, if you get wrong one of the orders of operation when solving an algebra problem, it means that all of the other, you, you won't come out with the correct answer. Why? Because there's one element or one variable missing from the equation, which means the answer will always be wrong. In that sense, using that as the example, you're always gonna get this wrong. And the reason why is because you have not inserted within it the most accurate assessment of why we need the housing element to begin with. Now, the red line map is the answer because it was the, it was the measure by which the Mexicano and, and the Chicano and the Blacks and the Japanese, all of these other races other than whites in Willow Boyne, Rose Garden, Nagley Park, Cambrian, all of these areas, it is the measure by which we were treated with inequity. So thusly, it stands to reason that that map within it contains the solution because you're not going to get an arrive. You may get the, you may get the law to agree with it, but, but just because the law agrees with it doesn't mean that it's right. Wasn't redlining lawful? So, you know, there's, 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 there's a really frank conversation that we need to have here within this particular topic because you still have not corrected, amended, rectified, or reparated the injustices that happened to my community as a result of that segregation. That was our only speaker. Thank you. Let's vote on this item, please. Supervisor Aranis. Yes. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Simidian, aye. Vice President Lee. Aye. President Ellenberg. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. We're going to break now for 30 minutes, so we will uh, resume at 1 o'clock, and we'll begin with item 12. Thank you, and bless you.
It is 101, and we will reconvene as soon as we have a quorum on the dais. Jess, let's take a roll to establish the continued presence of a quorum. Supervisor Arenas? Absent. Supervisor Chavez? Here, here. Supervisor Arenas present. Supervisor Chavez present. Supervisor Smidian? Perhaps coming through the door. Currently absent. Vice President Lee? Good afternoon, present. President Ellenberg? I am here. Thank you. You have a quorum. Thank you. Item 12 is the county executive's report. Good afternoon. Just a, a couple quick items for the county exec's report today. First, I just wanted to thank the registrar of voters and all the staff there for administering another smooth election this past week. Uh, as suspected, turnout was lower than typical presidential primary elections, currently 31.5%, but that'll rise a little bit uh, as the rest of outstanding ballots are uh, finished. Uh, that is a bit higher, uh, unfortunately, uh, than the statewide average, which is currently only 28% turnout. Um, as of this morning, ROV estimates about 52,000 ballots left to count, uh, the majority of which are expected to be reported in the results by uh, end of day tomorrow. Also wanted to share um, that Santa Clara Valley Healthcare is um, significantly expanding services this month. First, it's the uh, fifth anniversary of the uh, acquisition of the two hospitals into our uh, enterprise system. Uh, but also, as the board knows, last week we celebrated the expansion of the Valley Homeless Health Programs Clinic at the Home First Shelter on Little Orchard Street. Uh, that clinic is more than doubling its capacity mm -hmm. to provide care and services to our unhoused community members. And next Monday, uh, we're opening the Valley Health Center Morgan Hill. Uh, to expand health services for residents in South County. That expanded clinic will provide comprehensive primary care, GI specialty services, uh, laboratory radiology, pharmacy services starting next week, as well as cardiology and family practice services starting in April. And we're dramatically expanding urgent care at that site too, which will operate on a walk-in basis on weekdays from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. and 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. on weekends. So that's uh, long and coming and very exciting. Uh, and there'll be a ribbon cutting event uh, this Friday for Morgan Hill. Uh, that concludes my report. Thank you very much. Are there questions? Comments? Supervisor Lee. Yeah, so I just want to echo the uh, comment regarding the opening uh, or the expansion, excuse me, of the VHC, Valley Health uh, uh, Clinic, over down in the uh, Little Orchard, uh, which is uh, phenomenal how well it looks, uh, I mean, um, it's already been there, but having it now over 4,000 square feet really makes a big difference. Uh, both me and Supervisor Chavez got a chance to visit in person uh, during that opening and actually walk through the space. And one of the things that really uh, that I, I was very uh, pleased to see is not only they have lots of uh, individual uh, well uh, uh, staff rooms for individual consults, but at the same time, they actually have a, a bit of a pharmacy services to provide some of the uh, 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 anti-detox, detox, detox uh, buprenorphine, for example, uh, are able to be dispensed over there uh, with nurse practitioner. And so I think those are the type of services that whether those who are in 
the you know, at the at the shelter, or those who are nearby or who even finish services, but who is nearby could access to that services. So that is absolutely huge for the neighborhood. And I just want to say thank Paul Lorenz and our uh, VHC staff for a huge uh, amount of lift to make that happen. So thank you. Supervisor uh, Chavez, then Sumidian. Thank you. I, I just wanted to add that um, I really am glad you raised that, um, Supervisor Lee. And, th you know, it, that's a very impressive team. I also just wanted to say I thought it was wonderful that both Paul, Greta, and that Greta, you were there too, because I, I think the employees really appreciated um, seeing the leadership of the organization there to really honor them. And, you know, one, th one other... Um, thought that I had, and it's just that it was interesting to me to see how, how, um, just how inspiring the folks were that are working with the highest need folks, and, and that most of them had been there for a pretty long time, and, you know, and that's just, there's something that speaks so highly to the people to, who choose to work for the county, but it, in any way, people were excited you were there, Greta. Not so much about me and Otto, but definitely about you. <laughs> Sorry, I just want to mention that uh, what we finally determined the coolest person in our county is Greta because her title is also COO, right? Thank you. <laughs> Make sure to tell your children. <laughs> Supervisor Smidian. Let me ask uh, the county executive. Uh, we got some comment earlier today about staffing formulas in the nursing realm. I, I'm assuming this is an area you've been aware of or a concern that you've been aware of, yes? Yes. Could we get an off-agenda report responding to the concerns that were addressed? Yes. What's a reasonable timeline for that off-agenda report? I think within the next two weeks. Before the next board meeting. Could we get it by the Friday afternoon close of business before the next board meeting? Yes. Thank you. That, I think that, um, that would be helpful. Thank you. And that would presumably be a public document or no? Um, since it's also an issue that's part of the negotiations, probably not, but we could work on a different version that might be a public document if that's the interest. I, thank you. That's the reason I asked. I'd like to ask that there be a public version of the document as well. I mean, this is state law. Compliance is, of course, expected. Um, it's a calculable, if that is a word, thing. Uh, and so I, uh, I think it'd be helpful to sort of articulate the county's understanding in a, in a public document. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, item 13 is the County Council's report. At the March 11th, 2024 closed session by a 4-1 vote with Supervisor Simidian absent, the board authorized the county to initiate litigation in one matter. The name of the action and the defendant, as well as the substance of the litigation, shall be disclosed once litigation is formally commenced to any person upon inquiry. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Supervisor Simidian. Thank you. Just for the clerk and for the record, if there were only four people there, it's hard to have a 4-1 vote. Uh, that's correct. It should, excuse me, Supervisor, it should be a 4-0 vote uh, with Supervisor Smith and Absent. Thank you for the catch. Just, I, just, thank you. Good catch. Uh, item 14 we handled before the break. Item 15 is being held till April 16th. Uh, item 16 uh, is the budget inventory guidelines. Item 16 is uh, the report back with the implementing actions based on a referral and motion that was approved by the board at the January 23rd meeting. Uh, including the report is information on possible equity metrics based on the board's direction from that meeting. Um, we have staff available to answer questions uh, that the board may have, but no formal presentation. Thank you. I'll, I'll note that we have, uh, and I know was added but to the record, a memo uh, signed by Supervisor Arenas and myself. I'll turn to her to uh, introduce and make a motion, but first I'll look to see if we have any public speakers on this item. I do have two cards in chambers. Currently no hands raised in Zoom. 
All right, reminder to folks on Zoom, this is for item 16, if you're interested in speaking on the inventory, uh, <coughs> inventory budget, sorry, just looking for the title. Recommendations related to budget inventory. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. No hands in Zoom still. Our two speakers in chambers will be Sharon, Luna, and Connie. Great. You can please form a queue and come on up. and I wanted to put this issue ahead of 15 that was not going to be heard today. Um, but I want to thank you for looking at how we continue with the inventory budget. From the SMNA, we lived that experience because we never got any money the whole time until Supervisor Rennes came into office. So we did not know what to do. There was no specific guidelines, and I think I addressed this with you all before. And then we started doing the digging and found out that not everybody was a 501c3. It took us, because we were a 501c4, a while, you know, six months to get everything in order, but we did it. In reading through the documents that you have before you, um, it was interesting because there was nothing for that I saw to submit your financial statements. We, SMNA, has our financial statements ready to give, but we don't know who to give them to. And so for us to be, again, accountable and do follow-up, we, we need to know where your money's going. It's interesting when I see grants for 250000 but the organization has only spent 25000 where is that money? Does it come back to the kitty? Does it you know, just sit there? So it's important that follow through, accountability, and giving organizations an opportunity to submit their receipts. I mean, that's what you do. You have to, you know, to be accountable. So I thank you very much for your time. Hi, I'm Connie Romo Ludwig, also from San Martin, and I also follow uh, what Sharon had to say. Um, it's so important to have this funding available to um, nonprofit organizations. Um, however, um, as Sharon mentioned earlier, it's very important to be um, accountable and for follow-up. Um, there's no no free ride, and having funding uh, comes from taxpayers, and so um, uh, every dollar counts to help others. But I respectfully ask that uh, you do um, have your staff follow up and have a protocol so that uh, we do know how to follow up as well. Thank you so much. That concludes public comment. Thank you. I'll begin with Supervisor Arenas. Thank you. Um, and, and thank you to, to our speakers who came to um, give their thoughts about the budget inventory guidelines. I, along with you, think that there should be guidelines and I really appreciate what the administration has submitted um, in terms of including a standardized cover letter attachment um, to be included with inventory requests, um, the public facing website to disseminate inventory information, um, you know, the recommendation of of spending per supervisorial district, and and then the the opportunity to, uh, opportunity to reevaluate supervisorial district inventory items during mid year in case there's things that pop up that need to change. Um, the reason that I I have this um, inventory guideline um, is to support what the administration is recommending, but it is also to provide some feedback regarding the different type of um, equity metrics um, that are going to be used for to allocate the funds that are going to be countywide, right? So there's a certain amount that will be spent per district, and then there is a pot um, that is going to be shared by all of the districts, and we're going to determine how that pot is um, 
split um, and based on, on uh, some metrics that we decided collectively really represent the need of our community. Um, I know that in the past we've used um, equal, right, just cut, cutting the pie in five, um, but that's not um, based on the premise of equity. And so we are really um, shifting, creating this shift, and so what we need to consider today is how do we determine what metric to use? And, and so I think you've already seen that there is a Medi-Cal enrollment by supervisorial district. Um, there's a Healthy Places Index um, by supervisorial district, which um, includes a, a, a social, it's a social vulnerability index, um, is the, the last one, excuse me, um, by supervisorial uh, district. And so, all of these indexes are not perfect. Let me just start off with that. I wish we had one that we could all just consolidate and make it into one. Um, the one that I think is closest to what really is reflective of the need of our district is the, the first one, which is the Medi-Cal enrollment, because Medi-Cal is based on poverty, right, and income levels. And so um, I think it, it takes a true picture of who has need in our um, in our area. Um, the other two, uh, whether it's social vulnerability or um, the Healthy Places Index, are, are averages. And so for a district like mine, I have in one area, just one, my one little district, uh, council district, I have three country clubs, right? Mm -hmm. And then I have folks who are um, uh, very much Medi-Cal eligible. Um, and so then that creates a distorted um, picture of who is in my district, who lives in my district. Um, and uh, the, the Healthy Places um, does that, the social vulnerability does that, um, whether it's uh, taking averages in terms of, of, of um, assets in, in the district or uh, taking a look at open spaces and you know, the, simply because you have open spaces as an asset doesn't necessarily you mean you have access to that. Um, and so I, I don't think it's an accurate way of, of, or the best index to use, either one of those. Anyway, so, so, um, so I think the Medi-Cal enrollment is, is the closest thing, and I, I know that we've talked, we've discussed about maybe taking some elements of the other two indices and creating uh, maybe a super index. <laughs> um, but in the meantime, I think uh, for simplicity's sake, um, I think we should go with the Medi-Cal enrollment because it, it, I think it is the truest way of acknowledging um, it's a standard, really standardized way of capturing poverty. And the other indexes really don't do the job. So that is the reason why I have this recommended action. Um, of course, it's supporting what the administration is, is um, already providing in terms of their legislative file. So um, adapt, adopting staff direction A through D, which is what I um, reiterated at the beginning of my comments. And then additionally, selecting Medi-Cal enrollment as described in table one as the equity metric for the fiscal year 2024 to 2025 budget inventory process. And as I said, you know, this might be the beginning of where we, where we take a look at metrics and, and then eventually, I don't know if we actually create a super, uh, metric, but in the meantime, I think uh, for us to just move forward um, um, and and for us to acknowledge that Medi-Cal is, is a very standardized way of capturing poverty, um, which captures need. 
And then the second item is to direct the administration to continue researching and developing equity metrics that are most logically connected to specific roles and responsibilities of the county and report back to the board at fiscal year 2024-2025 mid-year budget. Um, the report should also present options to ensure the administration has effective equity metrics for other administration, administrative and board policy decisions. And it is, should also include progress of expanding enrollment of undocumented residents into Medi-Cal and how that has impacted the reliability of Medi-Cal enrollment as a metric. And I think I've expressed this to you, County Executive, um, that I think there is an um, under-enrollment um, probably true for both of our districts, Supervisor, um, because undocumented folks weren't allowed to um, participate previous to this year, I think there's a huge potential um, for enrollment, um, and, um, and I know that there needs to be a very concentrated effort um, in the areas that we think that there is under enrollment. Um, third is to update the attached board policy to reflect revisions described above with edits in the quotes underlined below, and, and it's outlined there. So we are, are hoping that we can take this step towards uh, really creating a process for our inventory items, um, and not only um, to make them uniformed across our districts, um, just the process. Of course, everybody has different needs, and so obviously you're gonna make your decision based on the needs of your community and what your residents have expressed that they want. Um, we just need to figure out a way on how to measure equity um, and maybe even discuss what equity means to all of us, right? Because I think that we haven't really had that discussion, and yet we, we, we have said that our budget last year, equity is, is um, integrated in, into the budget. I, I couldn't tell you um, what definition that we all have, that we all share together. Um, so anyways, this is, this is one way of really making that concrete, uh, that metric concrete and evaluating it the same way and that way it's a lot more fair for, for everyone, including our residents and um, those areas that are most in need. Um, anyways, and I, well, lastly but not least, of course, I wanna thank um, President Ellenberg for your support uh, of the inventory guidelines and for your leadership in um, our ad hoc committee um, that has taken a look uh, not only at inventory items but um, uh, the other areas that, that I know that our colleagues supported us in, in doing um, and allowed us to do extra work, <laughs> um, which has been very, very gratifying actually. It allows me to learn more about our county and how we do things here um, because I still and will continue to say I'm the new kid on the block compared to um, the level of seniority of, of folks who sit at this dais and I, I, that I get to share um, with them. Anyways, motion to approve all of what I just said. <laughs> I will second your motion and thank you very much for your leadership and your, and your really deep thoughtfulness around how to, how to do this in the way that's best for our communities. Uh, Supervisor Lee, your light. Thank you, and, and I will make that, that motion to approve the legislative file, not everything I said. To approve the motion <laughs> as contained yes, in your. as reflected on the legislative file. Uh, there you go, to, thank you very To much. approve the agenda language in addition to the memo. Correct. In addition to the, yes. it, yeah, it's already included because it says adopt staff direction A through D. Grand. Thank you. Thank you for confirming, uh, Supervisor Lee. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> so as Ellenberg, um, the uh, I, I just want to clarify from staff because I remember when we voted on this, I did mention the issue of potentially allowing the flexibility to allow different offices to help each other out to transfer some of the location to assist another office on the project. That's something that, is this incorporated already or it needs to be part of the motion? I think for clarity, it would probably be good to be make it part of the motion. Uh, it's certainly not precluded in any way, but there, there, and there would need to just be some um, clarity between offices if they were gonna shift some of their 
uh, designated funding to a different option. Sure. If I would like to maybe make that a friendly amendment to the maker. Absolutely. I will take your money. <laughs> <laughs> that works. Oh, well played. All right. Well played. <laughs> Thank and you, then, uh, And then the other issue um, is um, about the numbers, because I know based on the way previous report came in, they have all the dollars and cents. And I see you have now rounded to the hundreds of dollars, right? So now it's zero, zero at the end. So I, I think that should uh, fix that problem because obviously it's going to be very hard to try to award $6.24 to any group. So I think this probably would have solved uh, that that uh, issue that I, I was concerned about. So I should mention that. Thank you for staff for, for doing that. Um, and just ed adding to the comments being made, first of all, I want to really thank uh, Supervisor uh, Arenas along with uh, President Ellenberg for taking uh, on this project to uh, come up with a uh, program that uh, provides more sustainability in the long run of how these allocations are done. Um, as mentioned previously, the so-called equal distribution is not equal, is not equitable. Uh, I think one year it was like half a million dollars per district and, I, and we certainly have seen the the, the problem of that type of uh, uh, allocation. So this clearly has solved uh, a lot of this concern by having these equity metrics. I want to thank staff to come up the three equity metrics. I think they're all very, very helpful. Um, initially, when I walked in here, I was thinking the healthy place index is the one that I would prefer because of the fact that it accounts for like 23 publicly accessible indicators and eight domains and weight. So it's, it's great, but I, I really have no issues as to what's being picked today by in this motion. Um, I really do want to say that the uh, the speaker is absolutely correct as well regarding the issue of follow-up. Um, I'm just going to add a little bit more. My staff who work with me knows I have some funky rules. My rule number one is do not assume, but my rule number two is follow-up, follow-up, and follow-up. And, and this is exactly the type of uh, oversight I think is needed in order to make sure that this is not only money given away to the to the groups, but also to make sure that what they said they're going to do actually get accomplished. So I really do think that uh, that's something that would be be helpful. And I just want to urge, I don't want to make this part of a motion, but I certainly think this is something you know, to urge each of our uh, colleagues. We all have our way of running our, our um, inventory uh, program. Like for us, we have this thing called the urgent uh, program, URJ. GNT covering those areas, and, 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 and anybody could come to our website and see how we do it. I uh, have an application process. We actually even have a uh, separate independent group of volunteers who evaluate every single application that comes through uh, of these, uh, uh, of these um, inventory grants. It's a lot of work, trust me. And, and for that reason, we also have been able to, uh, I'm very proud to say that I come up with probably the most number of organization per year that we gave out. We gave out small amounts, and we had different different you know, philosophy here. Uh, we give small amounts per group, but then we gave to more groups. So uh, again, I think it's something that uh, each office would want to do it your own way, and I think it's great, but I definitely believe that the, the follow-up and the uh, uh, accountability is also extremely important because we are spending uh, the public money, and, and we are seeing so many wonderful stories that we see uh, after these funds have been given and how much it has really enabled a lot of these uh, nonprofits, especially even smaller ones, to use this funding to leverage, to raise more funds, to do so many great things in our community. So this is a really amazing uh, program. And I just, again, want to thank my colleagues for uh, moving this forward. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, I, I, I too, want to say uh, thank you to both you and Sylvia. This, again, goes under the category of a thankless job to try to divide up a very small, relatively small piece of the county's pie. And ironically, the budget is over $11 billion, and we're probably spending more on $7 million time on the $7 million than we will. don't have to. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's an important discussion, actually. Um, so a few things that I want to just observe. Um, one is that... Um, I want to go back a little bit and, and just to acknowledge the role the board played in addressing redistricting. Because um, prior to the changes made in redistricting, the issues relative to inequity would have really covered up what was happening in South County. And one of the reasons I, I voted um, and was so interested in us restructuring is because we really were trying to create a more uh, like districts so that we could lift up issues exactly like this. And I think this is, a, is very good evidence that the board um, did the right thing in terms of the 
you know, pursuing the changes that, that we did. The second is that um, if we were to take the percentages um, using the Medi-Cal enrollees and we removed the million dollar base, almost 40% of all of the $7 million would go to the district I represent because of the sheer number of people that I have in it that are um, in need of services. And I do want to just acknowledge that what Supervisor Arenas raised about um, how that, how no number, frankly, is going to, like one of the challenges we have with the folks that we represent is they don't often access services that they're entitled to. And so it means that we're always sort of fighting to make sure that, that our communities are represented. Um, that said, it would mean that, that of the seven million that the district I represent would be getting closer to 2.4, 2.5 million. I mention that because what I think it means as you all consider the discussion around equity is really thinking about um, the amount of the base and if this is something that happens next year because ironically we're, we're already um, disadvantaging access to resources for people who are higher need based on using that base number. And so that's, that's one of uh, uh, two reasons that I won't be supporting the, the work um, this work. The second, though, that I just wanted to um, acknowledge is that one of the um, requests by uh, you, President Ellenberg, and you, um, uh, Supervisor Arenas, is that you'd asked for a look at how we do a more rigorous job of RFPs relative to these kind of high need communities. Mm -hmm. And because that wasn't really addressed at all, I definitely can't support this because one thing that I think the inventory process does is that we, because we're out talking to people so much, we're, we are really seeing emerging trends in a way that our departments can't always see them because they're large and they're, they're, um, they're frankly, you know, they're trying to move really big pieces of work and we're saying, well, what about this and what about that? And I, I don't know this for certain, but as I was looking through the list of inventory items, one thing that was really interesting to me looking back at all of your items is that many, many of the nonprofits were relatively small. Like, in fact, I would say two thirds of what I saw were small nonprofits that probably didn't even have always the capacity to compete for grants. And the other is small nonprofits that alleviate the county of very costly interventions by sponsoring them versus some of the other work we're doing. Latinas Contra Cancer is an example of, of one that I have invested in. Cancer Care Point that you and I have invested in because it got wigs and other services to people um, in language in the east side. Parents Helping Parents, another um, uh, partner I brought forward initially because they were able to help people get signed up with, um, with, with Medi-Cal and other services that then removed the, the need for our general fund to be supporting families that then had access to different resources. That came from the board, not, not from the staff. And so one of the comments you make is that, you know, we want staff to have the opportunity to have more rigorous oversight. I completely agree with that if they were actually listening to the board and looking at emerging trends the way the board would be looking at them. So that's the second reason I, I can't support this. And I, I know um, for um, James and Greta, this is, you know, it's, it's, it's almost the, it, it's the middle of the budget process. So honestly, probably had we had these discussions in November, that, that might have been more rigorously addressed. But I think that um, The ability for the board to lift up those emerging needs is, is, in my mind, just can't be overstated. So I would be very interested in making sure that there's some discussion of F as a process, not, not an outcome. But I, F from the first, um, and this was the RFP recommendation that was made by our, super, our, our colleagues, that that should at least be discussed as part of the budget process. I don't mean, uh, I, I don't mean in terms of having a solution, but I mean as part of the final budget that of you being able to share what that might look like in the following years to come, because I think it is way too important uh, to frankly kind of gloss over, which I know that wasn't the intent, but that, that ends up where we are just in the process timing. So thank you, colleagues.
Sure, thank you. And just to note, there are those, those meetings happening. It's not going to be uh, glossed over. It's just not a direct part of of this referral Meaning today. I, that the staff is, yes. The, I, I know the staff is taking a look at it. I, I more mean, yes, and I thank you for catching that, uh, President Ellenberg. I did not mean to make it sound as if the staff wasn't considering it. What I more meant is that the timing that we're taking this action right now doesn't allow us gotcha. to, to address it, but thank you for catching my language. Thank I did you. not mean to be disrespectful. To the staff, there are other times I do mean to be <laughs> it, but that was not one. Thank you. Supervisor Simidian. Thank you. Um, could someone give me a packet page number on the motion, please? Is this the revised language uh, as opposed to that which is? It is, thank you. I do, I do have this document. I just wanted to make sure I knew which document was referenced in the recommended action. Um, I'm gonna support the motion today uh, and <clears throat> in part because it is, in my hearing, a bit of a work in progress, uh, and we need to figure out what we're gonna do for this year's budget, and then there's a look-see at how we deal with these issues on a longer-term basis. Uh, so uh, my support is, um, in part, a function of the fact, a significant part, uh, a function of the fact that this will be subject to uh, additional discussion for the future uh, and, you know, I'll just say, um, I, you know, I have a different take on which metric is probably the most appropriate. Uh, I would go with Healthy Places Index, but, um, uh, and it's sort of glass half empty, glass half full. It is a more complex measure, which is exactly why it's more challenging to use. On the other hand, it's exactly why I think it might be the more appropriate measure. Uh, but we got to do something this year. We got to get started. So I'm prepared to support uh, the item as it is uh, cast this year. Uh, and I um, just want to ask that administration uh, sort of play a robust role in, in helping to uh, the board members uh, work through what the future looks like in terms of this process. The one just specific question I have, and this is something that we've, uh, at least my office and I have confronted in the past. Um, Supervisor Lee, I think very uh, rightly said, all right, now how can we work to make sure that there's as much cooperation and collaboration in terms of support for various things, including sharing um, funding uh, allocations, but that of course raises Brown Act issues and I'm just wondering how we make our way through this process without running afoul of the Brown Act because it, 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 I'm guessing other supervisors, actually, I certainly can't speak for them, but I'm guessing others had the same experience my office and I did in years past, which is you'd, you'd like to know what's going on in, with your colleagues in terms of their potential support for an item if you're sort of thinking, well, there's a limit to how much I can appropriately ask for, but you, you know, are cautious about reaching out to the point of often simply not reaching out at all, uh, lest there be a Brown Act issue. Can go ahead? Sure, Supervisor, I can uh, try to answer that question. The cover sheet does provide for applicants to identify other districts that they have submitted applications to, and that is in part to facilitate awareness generally, but also to uh, provide an opportunity for a board member to reach out to a single other board member to have a discussion about a particular application. Of course, under the Brown Act, you couldn't reach out to more than one other uh, board member, and those kinds of discussions would need to happen in open session. Thank you. Supervisor Lee, then back to Chavez. Yes, I just want to address that very issue. Thank you so much, Supervisor Minion, for pointing that out. That is certainly a big issue, how we can make sure. If you recall, uh, last year we did have an issue as to, wait a minute, this group has been applying to four separate grants from four separate offices for equity issue. We're trying to make that. So I think in the way of sunshining our preliminary proposal, those numbers will come out to the public. That's not a final vote, right? So that way, everybody gets to see who's giving what. And then if there are duplications, if staff could then identify that for us, that would be extremely helpful after the preliminary look. And then at that point, let, let's say if uh, Supervisor Rena says, hey, I have this great project, it will cost that much, my budget only has so much, uh, there are other supervisors who would like to contribute to help me on this 
this uh, allocation one time, that would be the type of discussion we could sunshine it with all five of us, and that way that would eliminate the Brown Act possibility. That's just one suggestion. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez? Yeah, just on that one point, um, I, I will say that the, the folks who are applying have gotten more sophisticated, so they're asking you for money for one program, you for money for another, and then us, you know, maybe our office for money for another program. And, uh, and I think that speaks why the point that you both raised about why we need to refine the process, it really would help because, you know, because some, and frankly, some folks are just better at this than others. So I, I do think that's a really important point. You know, one, um, one thing that I, I didn't raise last time I, I was thinking about it is that the board took a position to get to the seven million that I don't remember if it, if it was a, and I'm asking my colleagues if that was a, because it was two thirds of what was requested last time or half of what was requested last time. Um, but my question is, um, based on the issue that I just raised about equity, um, would the board, would my colleagues consider adding more money to the equity component of this, not the base? And, and let me just be frank: the reason I didn't wrangle with this last time is I wasn't trying to take away anything from the districts you represent at all. It was really just recognizing that that the districts, the district that I represent, and frankly that you represent, um, have a have a higher need than other parts of the county. So my question is, did you all think of a different amount versus the seven million once you, you know, um, meted out the one million in office to make that more robust to be able to address the equity um, issue? To me, would be another two million to even not even it out, but make it more, um, to address equity in a little more robust way. Thank you. As, as noted, this is um, a process in progress. We did vote on the $7 million uh, cap for this year. I don't want to revisit uh, that. I also just want to make clear that though for sure districts uh, one and two have the highest need, I don't think we should be looking even largely to inventory um, to be able to close those gaps because the number would have to be so high to really make a difference. And that's where we need to be looking at RFPs and contracting and really frankly looking at our budget more effectively through, through a real equity lens. But whether we add one or $2 million, which frankly I don't wanna support because we have had the vote, we do have a um, really significantly challenged budget this year. Um, and, and we have had that conversation. So I think going forward, I would be absolutely open in future years to an equity measure perhaps for the full amount, whatever it determines to be. But this year, I would like to leave it as it is and not add more funding in this budget climate. So um, what I would request then is that, um, I'm, I'm just trying to decide whether or not I wanna do a substitute motion to deal with that gap for an additional two million in the process. And I appreciate the point, um, President Allenberg, that you're raising that we've had that discussion. Sure. But it, I what it's also just got the I didn't want to speak ahead of having the, the data in front of me, but this was um, based on averages and it's actually sixteen percent higher than the five year average. So we we did add to that knowing that the amounts wouldn't be even. It was I'm sorry, could you say it again, Susan? I sure, the amount was, let me just make sure I do it correctly. The $7 million was decided based on historical averages at a countywide level. And in fact, once we got to that number, the amount that was decided on is 16% higher than the five-year average. Anyway, I don't wanna get down a... a I understand what you're saying. Number. Um, what I what I would want let me let me just offer this as a, a substitute motion to accept the um, the the memorandum that both you and um, Supervisor Adenas put forward uh, with the addition of increasing it from seven million to nine million and and using the additional as part of the equity component. That would be a substitute motion. Is there a second for the substitute motion? Seeing none, none we're okay. returning to the original motion by uh, Arenas, second by Ellenberg. I think we're ready to vote, please. Supervisor Arenas? 
Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you, that carries with five. Thank you very much. Uh, item, uh, we're now going to items removed from the consent calendar and uh, Supervisor Arenas has requested that we move item uh, 34 to the regular calendar and she has submitted to us a memorandum on that item as well. So why don't I turn uh, directly to you, Supervisor Arenas. Thank you. Um, sorry, let me turn to that. I also have um, another another item on this. Um, another legislative file, excuse me, on this item. And so, I, one of the things that that I think um, I. I I bring with me <laughs> is a lot of process um, because uh, you know that there just has been quite a bit of uh, processes for um, for the for the budget and in in terms of transparency and uh, and community engagement and so what this item basically is asking is um, for administration to return with. Um, with an opportunity to have community meetings, budget community meetings that could listen to um, the residents and, and hear about what their concerns are. Um, sometimes in some of the uh, budget workshops that we've had in the past, um, th throughout the years, you know, you, you ask residents, here's, here's, our, here's our budget, you, 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 you break it down. Like where would you put the numbers um, and how would you break up the pot? Um, and it's an exercise um, it's that I think allows for us to capture not only their values and their priorities, but also allows for community to understand how difficult it is in terms of um, when we're dividing that pot, where, where do we actually put it? Um, and so, um, that is what one of the ask asked here and um, and uh, and actually it, the the other piece of that is so that we can have um, more transparency um, and really in participation um, from the uh, for the budget process um, and this is you know hopefully I can get support from the folks um, from my colleagues on this item. I know that um, you've all been dealing with with this budget for a really long time, and I'm a new to this. This again, I'm the new kid on the block. But um, when I think it, there is an item that my um, residents can benefit from, then um, you know this is where I'm going to um, provide that feedback, and so. Um, have a, a more transparent website that can allow for that timeline to have a breakdown of what steps or each each kind of segment of the budget process looks like. And then, of course, those community meetings that allow for um, us to share our budget in a way that it's meaningful to our residents, whether it's interactive and asking them to um, uh, complete a budget on our behalf or just listening to uh, what their needs are, but I think it's important to continue to have your ear to the ground um, around around the budget um, areas. Anyways, I, I, I think, you know, Supervisor Chavez said it earlier, you, you actually have a better um, figure to the pulse in your own respective communities, and I think those needs and um, uh, uh, need to uh, be recognized at a board level and certainly integrated into our budget. Um, and I think this is part of the steps that we need to take in order to um, create more equity and um, really level the, the playing field at a, at a system level uh, um, and not rely on inventory items to kind of do the job. I think we need to continue to, to hear what our community has to say. Um, because I think there's a lot that we respond to, and um, and we need to do it at a systems level. 
um, not just for um, our particular districts, although that that's what we're, we're appointed to do, but I think we need to make sure that we adjust the system so that system is um, responsive to the needs of your particular community. Anyways, I, um, I make a motion to accept the administration's recommendation relating to the budget process and then um, to have the recommended action that is outlined in my legislative file. I won't read it because I think you already have it. Thank and you. I'll second it. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. I'll come right back to you, Supervisor Lee. Um, Supervisor Arenas, I, I really appreciate this. I absolutely think you should lean into being the, the new kid for absolutely as long as possible. Um, I found it to be very helpful. Um, I, I want to just ask a, a question, and, and it may be district specific, but thinking about the community meeting part, and I know actually all of you other than me have served on city councils, um, and my understanding, and you can all correct me if I'm wrong, is that the city budgets have significantly more flexibility and independence and the vast majority of a county budget really isn't discretionary um, because we have all of these um, mandated areas of concern. And I, as just thinking about talking to my district, I would love to do a budget review with my district um, and absolutely love all of these moves towards transparency to kind of explain where our money comes from, what the heck we do to begin with, um, and to share that, where, where I would be nervous because I don't want to set up um, false expectations is having them uh, feel to any significant degree that they can really play with numbers and say, move this over here, move that over there. But I would be very comfortable doing the high-level description and talking about priorities, kind of concepts, as opposed to dollars here, dollars there. But these are the board's five priorities. My district, I would hope this would never be the case, but would say, well, three of those are dumb. We want you to do something else, kind of that conversation. Is that what you mean? Are you really thinking about I, moving I, dollars from yeah, one no, pocket I'm to another? Yeah, no, I'm leaving it up to administration, but I think okay. it, it, we could leave it up to the board to decide how we want to direct administration to provide those budget meetings. We could be talking only exclusively t uh, the general fund money that we, uh, we have some flexibility, um, and then describing um, the amounts that we don't have flexibility around. And I think that's also um, uh, important to, to for, for residents to understand when we have $11 billion, where is that all going? And um, and we can show, we we can only play with this certain amount. So I, 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 it's really open. I didn't, um, I wasn't prescriptive. Mm -hmm. um, so we can, we can make it however we want it to be. We can provide, we can ask um, um, our administration to return with an, a number of models um, that are that engage our community in a different way, and and then we can decide and have a discussion then, or we can decide now. But I'm really open to that. Great, thank you. And I, and I think one of the things, Greg, that might be helpful is to come back with sort of a model or a template of how we talk about the budget for each of us, then to provide input on does this you know, does this feel like something that I, as a supervisor, can go through in a community meeting? Um, I, I think I, my understanding or expectation is that the role of support from administration would be on providing materials for us to present. Um, I would, would think that we would organize our own meetings, but if budget staff or anyone is requested to be present to join the meeting to help answer questions, that would be appreciated. Uh, Supervisor Lee, then Chavez. First, I just want to say thank you uh, to <coughs> Supervisor Arenas for this proposal that she put together. Uh, more transparency is absolutely appreciated on our budget process because, it, frankly, it's very, very difficult to understand when you have such a huge budget, uh, plus the fact that uh, having these uh, uh, district by district type of presentations certainly would be able to help better show what we are bringing to our districts individually. So I think that certainly has been helpful. So I, I certainly uh, fully support it and looking forward to uh, support this. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez. Yeah, just um, 
I'm going to comment on the community meetings and just to say that at the city, um, part of the reason we started those meetings really just to say the point that you raised was that we had been doing um, work with a program called the Strong Neighborhoods Initiative. And so what that led us to was really having conversations with the community about redevelopment money only. Specifically. Thank and, you. and that, but, but you know, it created an opportunity for us to have more robust discussions in communities about would they like to see more money in parks or mon more money in policing, like some actual real options that, that were pretty, to be honest with you, at least depend, depending on, th at that time, because it was such a long time ago when I did that, Sylvia, you probably had a different approach, um, but it was really intended to get people's feedback on categories and, um, and frankly, to create more ownership. I think the, the, I do have a concern about structuring this in a way that doesn't create false expectations. I think that's an actually a really excellent point. And I would just say this, um, Sylvia, to you and to the staff that I think looking like we're only gonna be looking at the, um, the general fund dollars is also a little misleading because yeah, one is that people will be confused about, I think about even how much money we talk about being in general fund that really we don't have um, authority to, dramatic authority to change. Mm -hmm. we, you know, we don't, we use that general fund money to match some another government mandate. So what I really do love about this though is I love the idea about being able to do community education and, and really being able to explain um, how we use public dollars because I think we do a terrible job at that, not you all. I mean even when we go out and talk about what the county does, I, I have been trying to refine that forever. And like as an example, I, don't, I think our budget is really significant in part because of the hospitals. And what that includes is billions in insurance dollars that we have literally no, you know, we, we, are, we are a, that's an enterprise. I mean, it's not an enterprise fund really for real yet, but it, it will be someday, but that's an enterprise that we don't have a lot of say so over. But where I think it could be really helpful is getting people to understand how, for example, losing ERAF money, losing $32 million impacts the work that we're doing at a really basic level if you care about mental health as an example. So I'm really excited about that. I, I appreciate that um, that uh, supervisor at NS is really asking the staff for their feedback. And you know, I, I'm not sure the appropriate um, committee, it may be government and audit, but I think laying out a, um, a framework for those conversations is actually not a bad idea. And frankly, now that we have access to Zoom in a more readily available way for people who are super interested in getting deep with you, Greg, those other, I was gonna say other, Geeky, I didn't mean that in a bad way, but like, you know, other other folks who really care about this, I think could be really very, very good. So uh, so it, I'm excited about that. On the, um, if I could actually go to the staff report, under the budget modification for grant or sponsorship inventory process, not because I just wanna harp on that forever, but um, I wanna better understand the, this language, and it says here, Board of Supervisors proposals to modify the recommended budget for a one-time grant or a sponsorship are, re are referred to the budget inventory items, as to budget inventory items. Inventory proposals do not include ongoing operational proposals impacting county operations. As such, the inventory proposals do not include restoring budget reduction or augmenting or reducing funding for existing programs or funding for new services. So I want to understand exactly what that language means. Um, yeah, let me just leave it there. I want to understand what are we trying, what problem are we solving with that language? It isn't new language. Um, I think this came forward maybe in 2020 or 2019, uh, several years ago, and has been in these memos since then. Um, but it, what it's trying to say is that the in inventory process uh, is for basically one-time grants as contemplated on the action taken on, on uh, item 16, um, and that the board referral process is the process the board uses to establish new programs or initiatives, and that actions that are taken in the budget workshops and hearings to make adjustments to the budget for departments uh, isn't part of the inventory process either. But that's not, a, there's no change reflected in this language from prior years. 
so the um, colleagues, what I want to just caution is that um, we're we're dealing with a budget deficit this year, and I I think that the board should have the flexibility to make changes as it see fits, sees fit as we're going through the process. And I will just make one other observation. I know some people have used their inventory items for multiple year, uh, multi-year investments, even if they're using the one, the, the chunk of one-time funding. And so I just want to say out loud that, that I don't want to impede that if folks up here think they want to do a two-year program if they're using one-time money for it. That this language doesn't impede that, correct? No. Okay, and then the second thing is, is that I, I, I will not, um, I love Sylvia, your attachment, but I won't be supporting um, this item either. I was gonna pull it off myself today to, to say that because I do think in a, in a deficit environment, the board should have maximum flexibility. I do see these as guidelines, not musts, but I, I just wanna register my concern with the staff about, about that, um, that particular approach. So. Um, I love, Sylvia, your ideas. I do want to recommend the staff, you know, think a little bit about how to do this in a way that doesn't um, raise public expectations in a way that's unrealistic. And it might be worth somebody here volunteering to practice that this year, you know, just as a, and maybe, Sylvia, since you're the uh, newest and it might give you an opportunity to reach out to South County. I'm, I'm happy to also be a, a, a guinea pig this year, too, to try something. My, I'm planning to do something yeah. too that really is educational and high level. Yeah, and I, I like that a lot. So I would like to do that as well. Um, but I won't be supporting the motion because I, I think this is just a time that um, the board needs maximum uh, flexibility. Thank you. All right, do we have public speakers on this item? I do have one hand in Zoom, no speaker in Chambers. All right, let's hear <laughs> a single speaker on Zoom. Our speaker on Zoom is a phone number ending in 150. You'll have two minutes to speak. We'll open your microphone. You'll need to accept. And please go ahead. I believe it's star six to unmute yourself. Go ahead and try. Good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead. We can hear you. OK. Uh, my name is Doug Muirhead. I live in Morgan Hill. I am uh, very much in favor of participatory budgeting. I like the idea of community members being able to sit down and have some say in what goes above the line and what is cut by going below the line. There's also a very educational tool called Balancing Act, where you have categories and you have information boxes if you don't understand the categories and you can move money around, to, but if you have a balanced budget, if you give money to someone, you have to take it from someone else. This is, I think, in line with some of the hard choices you're gonna make this year. My last comment has to do with your budget workshops, which I have attended in person pre-COVID. They're essentially worthless to the public. There's a, a, a defined, uh, package uh, that the department has agreed to uh, Bay and the CEO is sitting there and I have never once heard of the department uh, had say, well, on second thought, I'd like to make this change. So I raised this issue with Supervisor Submitian when he was president of the board some years ago. Uh, I don't think I'll bother to try and attend the budget workshop this year, but I wish you well uh, in doing a hard job for for us, thank you. And that concludes public comment. Thank you very much. Let's go ahead and vote on this item uh, with a motion by Arenas and a second by Lee. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? No. Supervisor Simidian? Yes. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you, that carries with four. Thank you very much. I believe with that, we are adjourned. So Most many thanks. No. We're not adjourned? Yep. Just one, one more quick comment before we adjourn this meeting. I want to acknowledge the beginning of Ramadan, wishing everyone across in the Clark County celebrating Ramadan Eid Mubarak, and of course pray for those civilians who are really suffering in Ukraine and also in the Gaza area. Thank you. Thank you. And with thank you to the clerks, to the 
Creativ folks, to the security dudes, to all of the staff members and county employees who, um, who participated today and helped prepare us for today's meeting. Have a wonderful Tuesday.